Okay, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome online and here on Appledore Island. Uh, we're really happy to have you here today for a very exciting event. And um, so welcome to the Shoals Undergraduate Research Group Symposium. It is the culminating event for a lot of students who've been working very hard on this island all summer doing independent and uh, and larger program research projects. So I'm Jennifer Seavey. I'm the executive director of Shoals. And Shoals, just for those of you who don't know, is a collaborative institution between the University of New Hampshire and Cornell. It's the largest and oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country. And our mission is to provide outstanding experiential place-based education and support innovative research, like you're gonna hear today, and uh, focused on the understanding and the sustainability of the uh, marine environment. We are committed to undergraduate research education for over 56 years of operation of this lab. This is the place a lot of uh, professional scientists will tell you that they had an experience like what you're gonna hear about today and that's the place where they decided to become a scientist. It is an incredibly powerful experience. Um, and it is, this is sort of the capstone experience of Scholz. It is the most intensive uh, research experience for undergraduates. And we have some amazing students out here today doing incredible research. So in this program, a lot of these researchers are part of long-term studies here. Long-term monitoring research at places like Shoals Marine Lab, field stations, marine labs around the world is really one of the most valuable things that happens at field stations. It is the place where we understand the long-term changes in the environment. So we all know about climate change and how that's like a long-term ramping up and changing of the environment, but we didn't really understand that until we had long-term data. So a lot of these studies that you'll hear about today are involved in long-term data collection. And then the students are doing sort of subset or their own independent research out of those long-term projects. So it's a really incredible combination of long-term data, amassing a, a deeper understanding of this place and then spinning off a lot of really interesting questions with that data set. We take our stewardship of this place, this island, the waters around it very seriously, and we hope to be a model for the larger community. And we cannot do that without a strong understanding of the ecology of this place. And so all of these researchers you're gonna hear from today are helping us build knowledge that we can put into practice and help protect species and habitats and the system here in the Gulf of Maine. Finally, this particular program gives us this opportunity to hear about research and to engage all of you uh, in this platform today. So we're really happy that you're with us online and here in the room. And we will be recording this and putting this on our website for you to share with others. And thank you for helping us get the word out about all the types of work happening here. Science attracts other science. So scientists love to work on studies that have already been started. Those are the really juicy questions. So this is a lot of the seeds of future science down the road. So none of this would be possible without our science partners. And I'd like to acknowledge some of those right now. So New Hampshire Sea Grant, Dartmouth College and a generous uh, Dartmouth alumni who has affiliations with both Shoals and Dartmouth. Uh, Loyola Marymount University, and a lot of Shoals donors over time, uh, over the year and over um, uh, 50 years have set up endowments and current use gifts to support this program. I also really want to give a shout out, which we can uh, repeat at the end of this, to the Shoals staff from the kitchen to the boat captains to the engineers and everyone in between especially Dave Buck, who plans this all year round and sets up all of the funding and the mentors and all of this to make this possible. There's a lot of background work that happens before this, the researchers even hit the ground. And uh, we are deeply appreciative of all of that, to all the staff they're doing a great job. 
Um, I also want to express gratitude for all the mentors who have been the research principal investigators for all of these studies. Every single scientist that you're gonna hear from today also has a principal investigator and they've put a lot of time and effort and helping into the research and into helping these, these new scientists really get their feet under them and do some really great work. Uh, I want to really acknowledge right now, Mike Sigler, who has stepped it up this summer in so many stinking ways to help this program be so strong this year. He is fantastic. And Mike wonderfully brought um, uh, an incredibly talented cook with him, Flora, who's sitting on the back there and she has been feeding us both mentally and nutritionally all summer. And we are grateful for all of your help and all of your support all summer. So thank you, Flora. <laughs> And thank all of you for making time today to support the students, the science, the, all of the work that's happening on the island. So thank you for being here in person and online. And now I'm going to pass it to Mike, who's going to be basically our MC for the day. Mike. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth annual undergrad, Joel Undergrad Research Symposium. Many of you have traveled long distances to come here today and we appreciate your doing so. For our undergraduate researchers, today marks the culmination of their 10 week summer here on Appledore, lucky them. They arrived in late May and will remain for just three more days. For many of them, this summer represents their first foray into independently conducted field research. As you will see, each has done an amazing job engaging in research questions and seeking answers through an iterative scientific process. Each undergraduate researcher has conducted an independent research project guided by research mentors, as Jen mentioned. These research mentors guide our undergraduate researchers through questions related to study design, field sampling methods, data analysis, interpretation. They're the subject matter experts that make the research do its best. While many of them do not reside on Appledore during the summer, the mentors are here at the inception of the research program, <clears throat> typically make two to three trips back to the island during the summer and hold regularly scheduled meetings with the undergraduate researchers. In addition to the research mentors, Scholes has two full-time summer staff on Appledore Island who work closely with them and help with the day-to-day -day challenges of field research, finding guillemot nets and so forth. Uh, these staff include me as scientist in residence this year, as well as David Buck, the uh, lab's associate director. Great, great job. Great to work with you, Dave. As well as Jim Coyer, the program's coordinator who helped with the program start. All together, the research mentors plus David and myself are at the ready to guide the interns to the trials and tribulations of field work out here at the lab. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge each of these mentors. They have been so instrumental in the su success of this year's internship program. Please give them, them a round of applause. <clears throat> a big thanks also to the lab's team of engineers and boat captains. In addition to keeping the lights on, the water flowing and the boat engines running here at the lab, Roger Trudeau, Ken Lanneman, Ben Duffy, Dwayne Kehoe and Pedar Bronson are always at the ready to help our undergraduate researchers design, build and implement many of their experiments and navigate safely the lab vessels to their sampling sites. And another big thanks to Anna Golub, Kelly Morgan and Danny Danis, the island program and lab coordinators for vessel scheduling and field and lab support and for their general cheerfulness. <clears throat> Over the past 10 weeks, our undergraduate researchers have worked tirelessly on research topics that are important to the Isles of here within the Isles of Shoals and also contribute to larger scale questions within the Gulf of Maine and globally. And please recognize that today's symposium rep represents the culmination of a full summer's work. As for the symposium you have before you today, 
the, the outline is in the program. There's a full schedule. We will hear eight presentations before lunch and three presentations afterwards. Like a traditional scientific meeting, the undergraduate researchers first will present and then answer questions. They have 12 minutes to give their talk and about three minutes afterwards to uh, answer questions. Please take a few notes and ask questions. There's nothing better than being asked questions than you know people heard what you said. Um, and before we start, I want to highlight these students. This group is a great group of people. On Appledore Island for 10 weeks, <clears throat> they have successfully welcomed shorter term groups of interns, first the sustainable engineering interns, the Dartmouth interns, and most recently the intertidal long term monitoring interns. Group dances after lunch below the commons. They uh, get up and go just outside the, the window here a few minutes ago. Board games in, uh, in the evening and movie nights and everyone invited, everyone included. You really are a great group of people. <clears throat> I also wanna prompt some part audience participation where you have a chance to guess and answer students found for their research questions. First question for the audience, do black bait dolls mate for life? So if you think yes, raise your hand. Okay. If you think no, raise your hand. Okay, about 50-50. So remember your answer. Somebody, somebody will tell you. And then second, uh, how, and this is pretty cool. This Gilliman study is a brand new study. In some ways, that's, that's very risky. They work really hard with Liz Craig to find the Gillamont nest and other people like Roger Trudeau to help them find nests. Yet they managed to find 31 nests, I think, and conduct a study. It was very impressive. Um, so the second question is, how often do Gillamonts feed their chicks? Your answers, your possible answers are once a day, once an hour, or more frequently. So who thinks like once an hour? Okay, uh, what they say? What are my other, what are my other? Once a day. <laughs> once a day. Who thinks once a day? Okay, and then who thinks like more frequently than once an hour? Okay, just a small number of that. Okay, again, remember your answers. So, um, the, the, to start this morning now, the, the interns will first give a group presentation. It's meant to inject some humor and steady nerves and which will be filed their individual presentation. So please come up. All right, so we've had an amazing summer completing our research here on Appledore, and we'd like to share a little bit of that with you. This is our recipe for Snurges. Uh, but first, we would like to take a moment of silence for the 5,000 brave American snail lives that were lost to our research. <laughs> In a mid-sized island. Place 11 undergraduates. 13 expert research mentors. 142 plus great black backed bull chicks. 60 black guillemots. 3,174 turns. One thousand seventeen thousand five hundred and seventy two counted seals, seven hundred and fifty plus fishes, <laughs> two hundred and thirty eight hermit crabs, 
2,500 periwinkles. And some soil. Stir thoroughly with nine boats. Four pairs of sunglasses. <laughs> and three underwater cameras. Gradually add four noble rescues. <laughs> <laughs> 31 Newston toes, 60 sunsets, <laughs> and sunrises. This was on the social thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 430 well deserved attacks. <laughs> One hundred and eight opportunistic goal hormone samples. <laughs> Seven snake boards. Two types of food run. <laughs> Twenty-seven crabbing expeditions. And one giant lobster. <laughs> Mix in a generous amount of fragrant sumac. <laughs> Collaboration. And seawater from a great tide pool. At 12 fellow interns, three monarch caterpillars, munch and crunch. You, can, you should be able to. Yeah, it's very smart. Okay. One master of goals, four artists in residence, and a talented team of island staff. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, Ken. Woo! <laughs> A combined alternately with Pictionary, Portsmouth visits, naps, <laughs> poetry recitations, and we have a poem. It's called uh, The Muskrat. I oh, it's called the muskrat. I am the muskrat. Yes, I am the mush. I run to bush. I munch the grass. I itch the scratch. I rub my belly because I am smelly. I sniff the sky, but it's too high. <laughs> <laughs> And Kaylee dancing. <laughs> hang on, hang on, we get it now. <laughs> We get it eventually. <laughs> this makes one symposium. You can stop this before it changes. <laughs>
Can I get the card to get that in? Oh, wait, wait, make it smaller. Yeah. And then. Uh, first up is Lenny Laird from Dartmouth College, who will tell us about maternal transfer of maternal transfer of mercury in four seabird species in the Gulf of Maine. Right. So Thanks, I'm, Lenny. Um, I'm Lenny. This is um, oh yes. So these are four of the species of seabirds that are that breed on Arthur Island. Uh, from top uh, top left is great black back gulls roseate terns, common terns, and black guillemots. And they're all part of long-term monitoring projects, as Jen mentioned earlier. And my study uses data from these long-term monitoring projects and data I collected this summer to look at the way mercury is transported between parents and chicks. So for some background, mercury is a neurotoxin that's present throughout the atmosphere and in marine systems. And um, it causes, it's been known to cause um, neurological problems for centuries, but most people might know of it best through fish advisories, for example, um, advisories of how much, say, tuna that you should eat in one week. So this, this illustrates the way uh, mercury flows through the food chain. So, for example, in the best choices list are small prey fish like herring, which have less mercury in their bodies. And then in the list of the highest levels of mercury are large predators like tuna which have the highest levels of mercury in their bodies. So how does mercury end up in the marine food web? So most the biggest sources of mercury are um, anthropogenic. So things like coal burning power plants, um, internal combustion engines, and artisanal gold mining. And then organic mercury, sorry, inorganic mercury, element, elemental mercury is from that, is released into the air that enters, circuits around the world in global air currents, and then enters the sea through precipitation. And then, in sediment, when there's no oxygen, it's transformed into the uh, toxic form of mercury called methylmercury. And then that enters the food web, is taken up by plankton, and then um, is taken up by each successive level of, plant, of, um, of organism. So eventually, once mercury, so mercury also has, um, in addition to affecting people, mercury also affects other organisms that eat fish, including seabirds. So in birds, it's been found to change reproductive timing and behavior, uh, re reduce the clutch size of their nests, result increase in embryo deformities, and make chicks less likely to hatch. And though effects are all slightly different for different species, one threshold that's been found in several species is about five micrograms per gram of mercury in their feathers. It's a sort of an indicator of a level that might be too high. But the effects, the specific effects of mercury depend on species. So for example, um, families like ducks and geese are less sensitive. Families like raptors are very sensitive. And then families like gulls and terns, which are the seabirds that are nesting on Appledore that I'm studying, are about medium sensitivity. But concentrations, even within that family of medium sensitivity, um, concentrations vary a lot between species. So um, this is a summary figure I made from six different studies that looked at mercury concentrations in seabirds all over the world from 1984 to 2020. So it's a big range, it's difficult to compare them all exactly, but it gives a rough idea of the range of extremely high, almost um, eight micrograms per gram to almost zero. And so, but then another difficulty with measuring uh, mercury in seabirds is that there's a lot of variation even within species. So this is this, these two entries for pigeon are from the same, they were collected by the same people in the same year and published in two separate studies. But one, the top one, pigeon guillemot offshore is from, is the level of mercury in pigeon guillemots in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska that breed out at sea and then breed Feed out, feed off far offshore. And then the lower one is the levels of mercury in pigeon guillemots that feed inshore in Alaska. And the offshore feeding guillemots have nearly twice as much mercury in their system. And the authors didn't really know a reason for this. 
the opposite relationship has also been found for some species. They suggested it might be because of differences in global water currents, but it just illustrates the difficulty of predicting what, how much, how what the concentration of mercury might be in any given species or area. So just as a reminder, this is the five micrograms per gram threshold that people have found to be harmful, and several of these were over that. So even though it can be a little bit unreliable, there are some factors that you can use to predict mercury contamination in different species. So first is how much mercury that they're taking from their diet. So what trophic levels are they feeding at? And the second is how long do they have for the mercury to build up in their body? So how long do they live? So for these three species that I'm studying, the great black bat gull, the common tern, and the black guillemot, they all feed at different trophic levels. So the great black bat gulls are generalist predators. They eat mammals, intertidal invertebrates, and fish, whereas common terns and black guillemots mostly eat small fish. And they all have about the same lifespan. So a factor that could be affecting them more is their trophic level. This is a map of the way mercury might flow through a system on a um, island with breeding seabirds like Appledore Island. So an important thing to consider is that when with migratory seabirds, they are breeding, the breeding and they feed in different places in the breeding and non-breeding seasons. So a female bird will be feeding in the non-breeding season somewhere else and taking up a certain amount of mercury into her system. And then she'll arrive on the breeding island and lay eggs that have that concentration of mercury in them. The chick will be born with that level of mercury in its system in this box. But then the chick will be fed by the adults from local prey that introduces a different level of mercury into it. So there's also this, um, but it's also this, another thing that happens on islands like Appledore, which is where birds then introduce mercury back into the sea. Um, I'm, inter I'm also interested in this question, but for this presentation, I'm mostly going to be talking about how mercury changes from the egg to the chick and changes in the chick as the chick grows. So my main question is, how do mercury levels change with feeding in seabird chicks? And I want to see how the adults accumulated mercury burden is excreted into the egg and the mercury the chick accumulates through feeding before it's fledged combined to determine the chicks, the fledged chicks final mercury load. So this, um, this bit about how I did the study, this is Appledore Island, well, this is the other shoals at the top is Appledore Island. And these are some of the nests from the great bat bat gulls that I have samples from. This is CB Island, which is up over there. Um, this much smaller island that has a colony of roseate and common terns nesting on it. And then the, I don't have them in the map, but black guillemots are also nesting on Appledore and Smiley Nose Island. So for feather, the way I collect examples for mercury, there's multiple different ways, but I chose to use feathers instead of muscle tissue or blood because it's slightly less invasive and you can also keep the samples without altering or freezing them or preserving them, which is it makes them easier to transport. So I took adult secondary feathers to show what the concentration of mercury are in the adults. I took down from the chicks, which shows what the concentration of mercury was in the chick as an egg. So when it, before it was given anything locally and then new contour feathers from the chicks, which shows the diet that the chick was being fed while it was growing. So I collected feathers from these four species, uh, great black bat gull, Black guillemot, roseate tern, and common tern. And I also collected adult, adult great black bat gull feathers, which are on the right. And they are, as you can see, a lot, a lot larger and steadier than, than the chick down. So right now, I have um, only have feathers from adult great black bat gulls, but I have chick down from all four species and chick contour feathers from three species. And I have paired down and feathers, which will allow me to look at the change in mercury over time in one the same individual for black guillemots, common terns, and roseate terns, and then sibling groups, so multiple uh, chicks that are related to each other for all four species, which will allow me to look at the difference in mercury between for in um, the first chick that was hatched versus the second chick that was hatched. So unfortunately, I can't get really any results now because 
to analyze a fair of mercury, you need very specialized equipment, which I, ha which I have access to at Dartmouth College. So I'm, there's multiple different ways to measure mercury, but I'm going to be using a direct mercury analyzer, which essentially takes the sample, burns it, and then measures the amount of mercury that's in that vapor. So it's only measuring the total mercury, not the um, toxic form of mercury, but there's ways you can convert between the two and take some sub subsamples and measure the toxic form of mercury and see how much is in there. Get an idea of how much is in the vapors. So some of these are some of my expected results. I just want to say again, this is, no, this is real data. This is just what I plan on, how I plan on analyzing it and some things that I might expect to see. So first I want to check an assumption that I've made, which is that um, down, mercury, down, down feathers of chicks show how much mercury is in their body. So that's been found for other species, but as far as I have found, it hasn't been done for common or roseate terns. So I want, I'm, I'm collecting um, chicks that have died naturally and, and we'd be looking at the level of mercury in their muscle tissue and then comparing that with the level in their down just to make sure that that relationship is true and then using that to work out how much mercury is in the bodies of the chicks that I only have down for. And then I also want to see how do Alza Shoal seabirds compare to other locations. So this is more about seeing how what's happening on the Isles of Shoals and how it compares to other areas. So these, the ones, the, the figure on the right is a, another review figure that I made of two different studies, but those are both done in Europe. Um, and they are obviously very, in a very different system from here. And just can't read, it's difficult to compare between them. And there's only been one study of uh, mercury in a seabird species on the Isles of Shoals, as far as I know, and that's black guillemots, but they did not look at chicks. So kind of, I'm quite excited about that, just to see what is, what's here. So this is one, um, this is uh, just a prediction I was making based on trophic levels. So expecting black guillemots and common rosy terns to have lower levels of mercury and big black bat girls to have the highest based on trophic level. But again, I don't really know how it might turn out. And then I also want to see um, what, if the presence of mercury in these birds matters to them. So if it affects any of their uh, population, if it has any population level effects. So I found looking at chick down mercury and then trying to compare that with productivity or the number of chicks that actually fledged in that nest. And um, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to just skip the explanation the second one, but essentially I'm going to look, this is comparing the levels of mercury in chicks that were hatched first with chicks that were hatched second to see if Chicks that were hatched first have higher levels. So just to summarize, um, this summer I'm going to measure the, the mercury concentrations in the samples I've collected. And then some things that I hope to do or could be done in the future with um, data from these birds is maybe looking at archive feathers to see how, change, how mercury has changed in these populations over time. And then, and just, and then to better understand how they're getting the mercury, seeing how much is in their prey. So I just want to thank um, my advisor, Celia Chen, for her help, and um, Dave Buck and Mike Seeger for their help preparing this presentation and um, arranging for me to be here. And then Liz Craig and Mary Elizabeth Everett, who run the CBA monitoring programs and allow me to be involved collecting samples. And then all the search interns, but especially, you know, Willow, Ryan, Kayla, for letting me go along on their monitoring and take feathers from their birds. And then the Apple Store staff for uh, making all of this possible. Thank you. We have time for a question, 82. And Lenny, if you have a question, please repeat it so people online can hear it. Can you tell people online that you can make Yeah, one other thing I forgot to mention at the start of the talk is that people online can also ask questions and type it into the Q&A box and then we will uh, bring them forward. Harry. Yeah. Um, so the mercury levels in the 
the sort of export of the Mercury of the variant with the spine. Thanks. Yeah. So um, Perry was just asking how why I predict that how the um, levels of mercury in A and B chicks will be different. So um, a couple other stuff. The reason I think this might be true has been found in some other species, um, in a couple other seabirds, but that the levels of mercury in the female excludes mercury into the first egg, and then there's just less left in her body when she's making the second egg. So I don't know if it's going to be true for these, but that I'm expecting it to be true based on the way that um, it's the mercury is processed in the female's body and then moved into the eggs. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Um, so just a question about how uh, why ducks were less sensitive to mercury, and I hadn't actually thought of that. The fact that they might have more fat, um, that you mentioned that is really interesting. I don't know why that relationship is there, but that is a very interesting possibility. That could that could definitely be true because it is stored in muscle. So, yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Lenny. Next up is Liam Palmer from George Mason University. Hi, hi. Um, as Mike introduced to me, my name is Liam Palmer, and I am the uh, parasite ecology undergraduate researcher at Shoals Marine Lab. I'm from George Mason University in Virginia, and this is the presentation of the research I conducted over the summer. So when I first got interested in parasites, it's because I really like the weirder creatures in the world. I just think they're funky little dudes. Then I learned about just how cool and important parasites really are. And you might be wondering, what is so important about parasites? Surprisingly, a lot is. Parasite populations are indicators of a stable environment. The parasites I have been looking at in particular are known as trematodes, which I will touch on more in just a moment. The Owls of Shoals has been used as an important study system for parasites over the past 20 years. And what's been found during that time is that goals are the driving forces of trematode life cycles. Speaking of life cycles, I'd like to go over one of the life cycles that the trematode uses, and this is a graph that shows that life cycle, and this is for the trematode Microphallus similis. This is just a general overview of these life cycles, which can be complex and include um, multiple different hosts. There is a three-stage life cycle, which includes both asexual and sexual reproduction. Starting off, the eggs are passed through the feces of goals and seabirds and then are released into marine environments. For Microphallus similis, the first intermediate host, which is just the first host, are either Litterina obtusata or Litterina saxatilis. However, the most commonly infected snail is Litterina litteria with the trematode Cryptocotal lingua. And that will lead us to our first host, which I mentioned are the snails. They are castrated as the trematodes enter and asexually reproduce in the gonad region, generating copious cercaria that escape from the snail in free swimming fashion through the gills. And the castration, excuse me, castration process can lead to not only decreased reproductive function, but can also cause tissue damage as well as organ dysfunction. And I mentioned free swimming, and that will bring us to the crabs, um, or for this is uh, Carcinus manus, However, I did mention Cryptocotal lingua, which is the second host, and um, sorry, excuse me, the, trem the aforementioned trematode Cryptocotal lingua, the second host would be a fish instead of a crab. And when they enter the second host, they basically go dormant until that host is ideally eaten, um, at least ideally for the parasite. And then that'll lead us, for this case, the gull. 
um, that's where the um, trematode will sexually reproduce and the cycle will continue. Now I'm going to talk about the stars of the show. I looked at three species of Litterina. A Litterina litteria, or the common periwinkle, Litterina obtusata, the smooth periwinkle, and Litterina saxatilis, which is the rough periwinkle. So both the smooth and rough periwinkle are native to the Gulf of Maine, although the common periwinkle is actually native to the European coast. And speaking of Europeans, I also studied the European green crab or Carcinus manus, which is a very invasive crab. And as I mentioned earlier, there's only really one trematode species in the crab, which is Microphallus similis, but in snails, there's multiple trematode species. And I mentioned earlier about uh, Cryptocotal lingua and awesome, the video is playing. Uh, you can actually see the Cercaria swimming around. And this is under a um, 10 times magnification under a dissection scope. The white worm-like things you see are kind of where the cercaria are reproduced asexually in. And you, you know you've been looking at parasites for too long when you start to think the parasites are kind of looking a little cute. And this is, the, this is, the, this is a, a snail. And the second host is the crab. And this is a picture of the inside of a green crab. And there are actually two different types of parasites in this image. The first one is uh, acanthocephalin, which is a spiny headworm. So acanthocephalins also use birds as final hosts. So the crabs might be affected in a similar way that the trematodes affect the crabs in terms of bird abundance, which I'll touch on in a moment. And then these sphere-like things are cysts from Microphallus similis. Some crabs can even have hundreds of cysts in them. I dissected one crab, which had almost 900 cysts in them. Don't know how that guy was moving, but he was. Uh, I also just think this is a really cool image since it shows the size difference between acanthocephalins and um, the cysts. So now to the question I wanted to look at. I wanted to see if there was a similarity between the number of birds seen and the percentage of snails and crabs that are parasitized. I hypothesized that excuse me, I hypothesized that with an increase of birds, there would be an increase in the percentage of parasites in the snails and crabs. And how did I do this? Well, uh, to start, I went to a total of five islands that had different types of bird abundances. So the green represents the areas I got the snails from and the red are where I got the crabs from. Depending on where you are, you might be able to see that they're actually like images of snails and crabs. But I think from the back, it might be a little blurry. So to start, for Appledore, I wanted to look at multiple sites that would add on to the 20 year ongoing research for parasite systems. And I couldn't really get any crabs at all from Devil's Dance Floor. So there's just gonna be snail data from that location. And for those who came to the island, you may have not noticed that there's a lot of bird activity going on. Um, and birds in general are quite abundant. There are also a lot of people on here, so it might affect how the birds would behave in terms of abundance. And then I went to Smutty Nose. Smutty Nose is an island which doesn't have nearly as many people on it and is protected. There are gulls on this island, but since it's smaller, there are not going to be as many gulls present or just seabirds in general. And I also went to Star, which is an island that is owned and has a very nice hotel on it. The goal, uh, birds there are actively controlled and prevent it from nesting on the island. Another, I also went to another private island, which is Lunging. Huge shout out to the owners for letting me come around and collect guys. Um, <laughs> and there's a large cormorant colony present on that island. And finally, I went to White Island. There's also control of gull nests there, but there is a turn restoration project ongoing. So it's just to make sure the goals don't kind of go after turns. Now we get to collecting. For snails, I hand collected 80 snails of each Litterina species. And that would add up to 240 snails per location. I would also do bird counts by eye each time I went out in the field, which was usually about once or twice, sometimes three times. As for the crabs, I wanted to get 30 crabs per location. And for some places I did but the average crab per location was more around 24. 
to get the crabs, I hand collected them as well as set out several traps in hopes of speeding up the process. What ended up happening is I got pinched a lot and I caught a lot of things that were not crabs. So now in the lab, I would dissect both the snails and the crabs. And you can see my nifty little setup as well as the compressorium, which is basically just a tool that flattens things out to make things easier to see uh, on the right. So now I'm gonna look at the data I collected after I take a bath, <laughs> a breath. All right. What I found is that parasites were more likely to be found in larger snails. And this shows the three different species, um, the common periwinkle, the uh, smooth periwinkle and the rough periwinkle. And I also found that when looking at the prevalence of parasite rate by location in the um, species, it, and after doing some statistical tests, it was shown that there is a high likelihood of there being a difference in parasite rate um, based on location. And already I mentioned earlier that um, the common periwinkle or Litterina litteria has been shown to have, to be more abundantly in, um, infected with cryptocotyl lingua. Um, however, it is also showing differences in the other two species. And I'm only showing two of the graphs. The third one basically shows the same relationship almost. For, and for bird presence, uh, not, as, not as strong of evidence showing any difference between the numbers of bird presence and the percentage of parasites. And that's for Litterina litteria. And the same can be said for obtusata. There wasn't any evidence showing a difference, and Litterina saxatilis also showed similar trends. And I mentioned the um, crabs earlier. So average cyst abundance also didn't really have a strong correlation with the average bird number. And for acanthocephalins, the average of total acanthocephalins in the crabs were pretty low, although lunging was pretty interestingly quite higher than any of the other locations, which might have something to do with the cormorant colony. Uh, and one thing to note is that Cribs and Smiths are two separate locations, but they have the same count of averages for birds and prevalence of acanthocephalin. So I kind of just mushed them together. And for my conclusions, overall, I found that there was a pretty significant difference between pretty, uh, sorry, excuse me, parasite rate and the size of the snail, as well as the location the snails were found at. While there doesn't seem to be a strong relation with the amount of seabirds that are present, it could be possible that as long as there are any seabirds present, then snails and crabs have the potential to be parasitized. So what's next? Well, certainly more bird counts should be done to get a more true avid average of the birds located at each location since they move around a lot and might get scared by the presence of people. And also there should be continued gathering of the Litterina snail species, as well as the green crab to keep monitoring the parasite rate. And one last thing that was brought up to me by one of the gull interns is to potentially look at the diet of what gulls are eating in that area or seabirds in particular, in, in general, excuse me, in that it, um, to see if there's any correlation with what the diet is and what parasites are present. And I'd like to give a huge shout out to my um, main mentors, Amy and April, and my honorary mentor, Kay, uh, excuse me, Carrie. I'd also like to give a shout out to Mike and Dave, as well as the Shoals Marine Lab and um, University of New Hampshire for room and um, board. All the staff and captains on Appledore could not have done it without you. All of the fellow surges and the other interns that have made it through their way on the island for keeping me sane and in one piece, mostly. <laughs> Hey, Liam, we have time to do questions. Yes. All right, so the question was if Basically, if bird species perform differently as hosts and if that could have a difference between them, I think there's the potential to be there. I'm not certain because a lot of birds have very different diets. So, you know, there could be at white, for instance, there's a lot of terns and terns typically eat fish. 
So there could be more cryptocodal lingua there. And I didn't really analyze that, but I have the data for that. So it'd be interesting to look at. Yes. So had one staff that was doing this website. Have you been finding any different like their federal well-being based on how they are? Is there like a threshold for or was it them or like legal? Yeah, so it was basically asking um they were basically asking um if the amount of cysts could kind of impact their health in crabs and absolutely so with the cysts it kind of moves all their insides around. So when there's too many cysts going on, it can kind of stop function like with the organ dysfunction and just squish everything together. Great question. I actually don't know the answer. My guess would be it's probably like with fresher poop. So like once it dries out, that's probably not gonna really be viable, but I don't know an actual like number of, like an actual numerical time frame. Yes. So the cyst is just kind of like a, in a way, just like a casing for the parasite. It is the parasite essentially um, until it, Get, until the host of the cyst gets eaten and then they will kind of sexually mature and be able to sexually reproduce in say a gull. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for questions. Okay. Thank you. So next up is Mary Basilio from Darkness College. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Uh, my name is Mary Basilius. I will be a rising senior at Dartmouth College. And this summer, I've had the opportunity to study aging and altered shell architecture effects on marine hermit crab populations and behavior. Sorry. Okay. So to start off my talk, I'm sure that all of us can think of amazing human architecture, whether that be world famous sites or uh, just places in our everyday life. For me, growing up, I had the opportunity to visit um, the Sphinx and the pyramids of Giza in Egypt with my family. And I've also, a couple of years earlier, I had the opportunity to visit the Great Wall of China. Um, and so I think what some people don't recognize is that animals can also build amazing architectural structures. One example is this uh, beehive. Another one are termite mounds. And so these are several different morphs of a termite mound, which is really incredible uh, when thinking about the size of these individual organisms. Uh, and just a final example, this is a rufous motmot. It's a type of bird. And uh, this type of bird doesn't nest how we normally think birds do. They actually dig a burrow and this one is sticking out of its burrow. So for my project specifically, I was interested in looking at hermit crabs. And so marine hermit crabs utilize the remnant architecture of snails. So this is a snail, this is, oops, L. litteria. Um, and this is the gastropod um, or the snail is the architect inside the shell. Um, but when the architect is no longer in the shell, these marine hermit crabs, and um, this specific species is Pegris acadianus, is able to utilize that remnant architecture as its home. So it's important to note that these hermit crabs have some sort of metric to select their new homes or this remnant architecture. And it's really important that they select a good shell because uh, the shell is essentially its only protection um, of its vulnerable abdomen. It's, it's very soft and there is no uh, protection and Without a good shell, they can get predated very easily. Also, where we're located right now here on the um, 
on Appledore Island in the Gulf of Maine, uh, we noticed that the ocean waters are warming rapidly. So we know that our climate and our environment is changing. Uh, and even in the last 20 years, we can see a rapid uh, increase in ocean temperature. So I was specifically interested, oh, and this, you can't see the question up there, but um, I was interested in looking at what effects do um, intensified and novel weather and environmental conditions have on the utility of remnant shell architecture. Uh, and so I was interested in looking at the effects of degradation on land. And this is just an image from the great tide pool. And those are shells and uh, degradation in the sea. And this is an image from the crib subtitle zone off of the island that we're on now. So essentially what will happen to aged shells on the land versus in the ocean? So the first hypothesis is that the land weathered shells uh, will be degraded more intensely over time due to the environmental conditions present on land. And alternatively, that the shells in the ocean will be degraded more rapidly uh, because of the conditions present in the ocean. So for this project, uh, my advisor, Mark Lydra, has set this up um, going back all the way to 2018, where uh, the lab has left out cages of cleaned out uh, litterina shells or litteria shells um, on both the land around Appledore Island and in the ocean in the crib subtitle zone. And so each year since 2018, we've been able to collect a cage of shells. Uh, and so we have an assemblage of shells from 2018. And by the end of this season, we'll have an assemblage of shells from 2022 uh, aged on both the land and the ocean to analyze. So I'm not able to analyze uh, some of the data here because in the fall back at Dartmouth College, I'll be using an Instrong 8871 crushing machine. And that's a figure of essentially the methods I'll be using to crush all of these shells to get what's called a maximum compressive load. And I'm looking to use that as a proxy for shell strength over time across these two conditions. And this is anticipated to be done in the fall of 22. So just some preliminary ob observations that we were able to get from these shells. Uh, so this is an image of a litteria shell that was found uh, in the subtitle zone in the ocean. And as you can see, there are a lot of epibionts growing on it. And so an epibiont is essentially anything that is growing on the shell. Uh, and so these include things like polychaete worms, seaweed, even leftover hermit crabs, anemone, lichen, barnacles, and clams. And so these things are all um, gross and structures that can impact the architecture of the shell because once an architect or the snail is no longer present, there's no organism to maintain the structure and repair it if it's damaged. Uh, and so this is just a figure of uh, land versus sea from 2019 to 2021, showing the presence of epibionts. And if you look, uh, you can see that the 2021 sea, the far uh, right orange bar, uh, almost all the seashells left out by year three had epibionts growing on them, uh, where the ones on land do not have epibionts growing on them. Similarly, we also were able to get some, oh, sorry. Similarly, we were also able to get some data on the holes present of these shells when we were measuring them. And we can see that over time, um, but especially in the ocean, that holes become more and more apparent. So just this preliminary information seems to suggest that degradation is happening more significantly on the ocean or in the ocean zone uh, as opposed to on the land. Uh, and so while I was here, I was also able to contribute to a years long um, project with my advisor that focuses on acidified shell choice experiments. So in talking about changing environmental conditions, we also know that our oceans are warming and they're also acidifying rapidly. So in these experiments, uh, I was able to collect some marine hermit crabs from the subtitle zone uh, via snorkeling in the crib subtitle off the coast of uh, this island. Uh, and then also I was able to collect an assemblage of litteria shells from the great tide pool uh, via hand collection. And so with these uh, specimen, I was able to set up a bunch of choice experiments. So just to give a visual on what that looks like, uh, with a collected individual, a hermit crab, um, we would measure its shell diameter. And that's an image of how we measure shell diameter. From there, this hermit crab was given over the course of 24 hours two brand new shell choice options uh, of its same size. 
So one of these shells, uh, the one with the red X is a acidified shell or a poor shell choice. And the other one is one of the same size, but it's a control shell. So how did I acidify these shells? Um, for the choice experiment, we had two different treatments. So one acidified shell was a two hour uh, vinegar soap in 6% vinegar. And that uh, even visually, we are able to see that significantly weakens the shell and makes it a poor choice because it's less protective. Uh, and then also we did a momentary vinegar dip treatment. And so the reason why we do that is to make sure that the vinegar itself is not causing some sort of interaction with the hermit crab shell choice. Uh, and that's just an additional control. So from our first experiment, uh, we got some data and we see that uh, 13 individuals picked the acidified shell choice, uh, and that's the bad shell choice out of a total of 30. So we do see that a significant um, group of these individuals are selecting a bad shell choice. Um, and so while these results are not significant, we can see that these hermit crabs don't know that this new acidified shell is a bad home option for them. So to kind of get to the bottom of this, I ran some more experiments, but this time I started out by uh, with a new hermit crab, giving it 10 brand new shell choice options ranging from 16 millimeters to 25 millimeters. And essentially this simulates um, giving a hermit crab its ideal home. So essentially in an ideal world, what shell size would it like to be in? After they made their choice, let's say for example, this hermit crab uh, selected that shell size, they would get another uh, acidified and control choice, two size matched options. Uh, and so here we were also able to get some data on um, the shield length versus the ideal shell choice. So if the size of the hermit crab has any impact on it choosing its ideal size, um, and even though this is a weak positive correlation, we see that generally the bigger hermit crabs take bigger shells, which makes sense. And we also see that a lot of hermit crabs that were found uh, in nature were not in its ideal home size. And so the results of this show that 11 individuals selected the acidified shell, which is the bad choice. And um, again, we see that the momentary dip or the vinegar essentially is not playing a part in their uh, decision making because that's almost a 50-50 split. So why does this matter? Um, aside from just being cool science, in my opinion, uh, this is important because we know that our climate and our environment is changing rapidly. So understanding how these uh, new weather and environmental conditions are going to impact things like remnant architecture is going to give us information on how these marine populations are going to react um, even beyond just marine hermit crabs. Um, so the main takeaways is without an architect or the snail, remnant architecture, architectural structures can alter significantly. Shells are aging differently on the land versus in the sea. And we know that marine hermit crabs are making poor shell choices. Um, so even though we don't know exactly why that's happening, uh, it's important to know that they are making poor shell choices um, and that's going to be important in thinking about years to come how these marine populations are going to change. Uh, so some potential reasons why they're making these poor choices uh, could range from things uh, just to individual variability. Some individuals uh, might be more risk averse or risk prone in terms of selecting a new or novel shell choice. Um, it could also be things that we haven't had the opportunity to explore this summer yet, such as the uh, differences between the male and female hermit crab um, or other just internal physiological things that uh, would be really interesting to look at. Uh, and just to end off, um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Mark Ledger, who is my advisor, uh, as well as the Shoals Marine Lab for this great opportunity. Um, a big thank you to Mike Sigler and David Buck uh, for mentoring me this summer. Uh, as well as the island staff and a big thank you to the kitchen staff and you'll see why in a moment um, and of course all the summer 22 interns um, so yeah a big thank you to the kitchen staff because that's where i boiled all of the snails to get the clean shells um, and a big thank you to all of the interns for um, helping out and being um, great support for my project because it would not be possible without them thank you <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, questions. So we have time for a few questions. So the acid preparation of the uh, the acidity of the shell, 
Yeah, so we haven't taken a mold or anything of the inside of the shell yet, but we do know that it is significantly lighter and I don't think it is enough or a strong enough acid to completely wipe out the internal spiral structure, but I do believe that it is enough to um, widen it and make it less, uh, a less tight fit inside of the shell. And the question was, um, does the acid degrade the interior of the shell? And my, Maya Madison did a great job. Oh, thank you, Maya. Mm -hmm. okay. There's another question over here. Um, yeah, so the question is asking about the hermit crab longevity versus inside the shell. So I don't have an exact lifespan on the hermit crabs actually, but what we do know is that hermit crabs are really focused on finding good shells and new shells. So at any opportunity, if they come across an ideal shell or a better shell than the home that they're in now, they will swap into them. Um, and this plays into um, a lot of social behavior with these hermit crabs, but um, I don't have an exact number, but they do actively seek better shells because again, it is their only form of protection um, and is kind of their livelihood. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was asking if these hermit crabs come up on land or if it's an environmental factor um, pushing these shells in. Um, so these hermit crabs are subtidal and they will not come up on land or should not come up on land. Um, but it's very plausible that these shells or this remnant architecture will get washed up on shore and some might degrade on land and then get washed back out. Others might just stay in the sea. So that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So from previous research, we do know that hermit crabs tend to stray away from shells that have things like holes or like very obvious um, degraded patches because again, this is going to make it so much easier for them to get predated. Um, and so some studies suggest that they also evaluate things like weight because a heavier shell is going to be one more protective, but also it's going to help them anchor uh, to the subtidal zone so that they don't get washed out during tides. And then that'll, that impacts them because if they have to work to stay anchored, that's going to waste a lot of me metabolic energy. Um, so yeah, they do have uh, different criteria for evaluating these shell choices, but I guess from what I found out, we see that this like new super acidified shell isn't something that they're recognizing as a bad choice. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you. We'll end the first three, and uh, we'll be resumed. There'll be a break now until 10 30. Uh, I can't give you extra credit, but I give you extra credit. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's scary. Pardon? It's scary. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, so we are going to make you set up the next show. Um, I spent so much time Host, yeah, we can make Chloe. Um, are we muted?
Uh, next up is Ma Melanie Carolyn from Vassar College. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Melanie, and I am excited to be talking to you about how I've been assessing the diversity of marine species using remote underwater videos or rubs. And let me just make this bigger. There we go. And so all the videos that you see in this slideshow are videos that I have taken as part of my project. On the screen right now is a harbor seal. So on June 11th, 2022, I went out with the fisheries class on a mackerel fishing trip. We caught one mackerel. <laughs> on July 22nd, 2022, I went out with a shark fishing class. At the beginning of the trip, we wanted to see if we could catch some live bait. Within minutes, we were pulling up four mackerel on a line at a time. What was the difference here? It could have been the date, it could have been the time of day, where we went. We don't really know. A lot of it was luck. That shark fishing class, our goal was not to catch mackerel, it was to catch sharks. This was a 10 hour trip and we caught zero sharks. Towards the end of the trip, I asked the shark captain, do you have any guesses as to what the sharks are up to right now? He replied, if I did, we would have caught something already. <laughs> this illustrates how important it is to know what is happening in our oceans. This is the first year of the fishery science project. That's really exciting, but it means we had a lot of work to do. My goal was to establish a long-term monitoring of fish abundance and diversity around Appledore Island. So how do we see what is happening beneath the ocean surface? One method is invasive sampling. This is taking organisms from the ocean out of the ocean. This disturbs the organisms and can even lead to their deaths. Another method is diving in submersibles, so sending humans under the water. This can disturb ecosystems and lead to observer bias. So if humans are in places where there's usually not humans, fish might behave differently or you might see different fish than you would otherwise. Let me introduce you to the idea of remote underwater videos. For people on Zoom, there is a photo on the screen. Everyone in the room, there is actually one set up right over here on my left. And these are also called rubs. These sit on the ocean floor and they have a camera towards the back. So they record for about an hour to an hour and a half at a time. The camera looks down an arm, and if we want to put bait on these cameras, we actually hang the bait cage off of that arm. In this case, it is a baited remote underwater video or rub. So this summer I was mostly using unbaited cameras because I was really interested in passive, passively monitoring these organisms. I wanted to see what they were doing with as minimal influence as possible. I did try bait a couple times, but I just preferred the unbaited. So my main question was, are RUVs a viable method for assessing marine diversity around Appledore Island? To consider this, I had to think about whether they were practical and successful. So in order to know if they're practical, we have to look at my sampling method. This is a map of Appledore Island. I divide the island into six regions. And each day that I went out to sample, I tried to go pretty much every day. And I went to one of the regions and I dropped three of these remote underwater cameras in three sites in each region. So on one day I would go to region one. The next day I would try to go to the opposite side of the island. The goal of this was to get as comprehensive a sample as possible because I didn't want to go too long without sampling either side of the island. And I essentially, I repeated this pattern of going to alternate sides of the island all the way around. This resulted in observations all around the island. So these are 49 of my sample locations and it spans pretty much the entire island. Right now I have a total of 49 videos analyzed but I have over 160 videos collected. That means that they were pretty practical. So it was easy to collect a lot of data. This is a breakdown of what species we were seeing. Oh, this at first glance, it looks like we were seeing very few species. It looks like we were seeing zero of a lot of these individuals, but only nine of the 49 videos had zero species. That's only about 18% of the videos. That tells us that RELVs were practical, practical and successful because we were seeing a lot of individuals. 
that begs the question of why so many of these entries look like they're zeros. Well, that means that during these deployments, in, so, in one deployment, maybe we're seeing certain species and not others. And in other deployments, we are seeing the reverse. So my next question is, what factors may help explain the variance in the species richness and abundance of marine life observed in nearshore waters around Appledore Island? To consider this question, I looked at several factors. I will not be talking about all of them today because we have limited time. But essentially, I found that location time, depth, vegetation, tide, habitat, and wind speed and gust speed all seem to be pretty important. So first, let's talk about location. This is a breakdown of where I was seeing high species richness. So species richness was my measure of the number of species per hour of video. And that essentially allowed me to account for the fact that in longer videos, there was more time for species to pass by the camera by chance. And this aligns well with where my regions are located. And it's important to note that this is not uniform around the entire island. So we are seeing higher species richness in region one and region three. We can also break this down by transects. So these are based on the already established intertidal transects. And we see that there's peaks in the species diversity, the species diversity pretty much all around the island. That's really interesting because I was expecting to maybe see a difference between the east and the west side of the island. And we didn't really see that here. This is a breakdown of where I was seeing fish or teleosts. And I wanna talk about two species in particular. So I saw a lot of pollock and a lot of cunner. And I was really interested in whether these two species were responding to these factors in similar ways. And this is a cunner on the left. So when we look at their maps compared to each other, it looks like both of them were spread pretty much all around the island. We can look at their radar plots. That shows us that pretty much they were appearing in similar locations. So they were responding to location pretty similarly. We can also consider time of day. I was seeing high species richness in the afternoon, especially around three o'clock. And when we look at Pollock and Cunner compared to one another, they both responded to time in very similar ways. So more species later in the day. We can also consider depth. This is a graph of sinking time in seconds compared to species richness. So sinking time was my proxy for depth. You can think of this as essentially 20 seconds means 20 feet because the rubs I calculated sink at a rate of about one foot per second. And we see a pretty clear positive trend here. So at greater depths, we saw higher species richness. And looking at Pollock and Cunner again, they both responded in very similar ways. So more individuals at greater depths. I also considered vegetation. This is a box plot of the different vegetation lengths I was seeing. So when I was watching my videos, I was looking at what the vegetation lengths were. So short, medium, or long, or combinations of those. And this was really cool to see because we see that as vegetation length gets longer, we typically have more species per hour. And with greater variation in what vegetation lengths there are, so short, medium, and long altogether, we saw a greater species richness. And Pollock and Cunner responded in very similar ways to this again. So we saw a lot of individuals with long vegetation and a decent amount of individual, individuals with medium length vegetation. Initially, I wasn't going to talk about the vegetation amount. This is another way I was categorizing the vegetation I was seeing. And just looking at the species richness, it looks like species richness was kind of similar between different vegetation amounts. So whether there was minimal amounts of vegetation or lots of vegetation, there's different variation between these box plots, but they line up pretty well. But then when we look at the different species, so Pollock versus Cunner, we see that there's a lot of Pollock when there's abundant vegetation, and there's a lot of Cunner when there's either abundant or minimal vegetation. So this was the main difference that I saw between the two species because pollock aren't as common when there's minimal vegetation. The last factor that I want to talk about is wind speed. This is a plot of wind speed versus species per hour. And I only include wind speed because the gust speed graph looked very similar to this. And this was really interesting because we see in a weird curve in here. So there was low species richness when we had low amounts of wind, high species richness with intermediate amounts of wind, 
and low species richness when we had a lot of wind. I thought this was interesting because it aligned well with something called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. So I wanna draw a couple of conclusions. First of all, and perhaps most importantly, Rub's work, and that's really exciting because we are collecting so much great data from these videos. Uh, one of the greatest things about these videos is they give us a look into behavior. So I didn't even scratch the surface of behavioral observations, but I was seeing things like feeding and foraging, uh, interspecies interactions, interactions with the rub itself, and even predation. So I'm really excited to see how these cameras are going to be used in the future to study those aspects of these individuals. In addition, many different factors are important for determining species richness around Appledore Island. There was a positive correlation between Pollock and Cunner. So when there were few Pollock, there was often few Cunner. And when there was a lot of Pollock, there was often a lot of Cunner. Pollock and Cunner responded similarly to most factors, except for vegetation amount. So Pollock were present in large numbers when there was abundant vegetation and Cunner were present in large numbers when there was either abundant or minimal vegetation. I'd like to thank Mike Siegler and David Buck for their help with my project, especially Mike for letting me use his computer to make my maps. Easton White and the members of the UNH Marine Quantitative Ecology Lab for making this project possible. Ken Roger and everyone who captained boats because without all of them, I would not have been able to go out and do my sampling around the island. Anna and Kelly for sitting down with me and figuring out how to insert my sampling times in with the Shoals Marine Lab's very busy boat schedule, the Shoals Marine Lab island and kitchen staff, and all my fellow interns for coming out on the boats with me and being excited when I showed them highlight clips. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Melanie, that was great. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, so the question was whether or not there would be an advantage of making the cameras more camo camouflaged. And that's actually something we did consider. So we considered coloring the cameras black to make them less noticeable. And that would be a great way to minimize, help minimize our influence. And I would be really interested in trying that. But at the same time, I loved having these white cameras because we were able to see things like curiosity. So a lot of the fish I, were, I was seeing would come up and rub against the arm of the rub. So it would be kind of a trade-off between trying to minimize our influence and being able to study things like that curiosity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so most of my cameras were dropped in 15 to 25 feet of water. I think the deepest was probably around 30 to 35 feet. And I've actually been considering whether or not we want to keep the cameras closer to the island or further out. So that would be something that we'd have to consider in future years and whether we would also want to try pelagic. So as I was saying, these cameras sit on the bottom of the ocean to study benthic life, um, but you can also do pelagic. So in very deep water, the camera can be floating. So it's really a matter of like seeing what works. In the summer, we were mostly focusing on the 25 feet range around there, but I would be really interested to see if deeper waters would result in more observations. But the trade-off, I think, would be it would be darker. So we might not be able to see as well. Yeah, so the question was about what, like when we were seeing high winds and low amounts of fish, like what could maybe be influencing that? I think that it could be a combination of factors. So one thing I was considering was with high wind speeds, you might get stirring up, stirring up of nutrients. So maybe we would see more individuals, but when we were seeing low amounts of individuals, it was really interesting because that kind of was the opposite of what I was expecting. So it could be that these were close to shore and close to rocks. So the fish may have been further out away from the island to be 
away from the wave action. Yeah. Three questions. Melanie, your connector. Thanks for organizing with help from Liam and uh, Lenny the talk. What's that? Quite a challenging Zoom talk, and she was presenting on Zoom. So, next up is uh, Willow Dalheit from Princeton University. Yay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Click that button. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Willow. Um, I recently graduated from Princeton, and I'm really excited to be here um, studying this amazing species of bird. Um, fun fact I didn't know black guillemots existed before I got to this internship. Um, okay. So, some of my past experience at Princeton, I've studied birds um, for two pre previous summers. And I'm really interested in learning about breeding behavior specifically, including pair bond behavior and also cooperative brood care. So I was interested in combining my interests in this project um, to study uh, parental care behavior strategies in black guillemots. So uh, questions I'm interested in include, how do parents coordinate successful rearing of their young? And how do they deal with sometimes competing ecological constraints? So parental care takes time and energy. Uh, this involves tasks like provisioning, incubating and brooding, nest defense, um, and travel from foraging grounds to, net, to the nest site, which is really important, especially for seabirds because they often fly long distances to get from their breeding grounds on shore to where they forage out at sea. Um, and this is one of my videos that I took. You can see it with a, a rock gunnel. Um, there are various factors that affect parental care behavior, including the risk of predation, so predator avoidance, food availability, and energetic costs. And breeding is costly. So um, because birds have to spend a lot of energy doing this, they have to balance um, various costs and benefits of that. So it's adaptive to reproduce so that they can pass on their genes. Um, but it's also adaptive to minimize the personal cost of reproduction. So you want to be successful, but you, you don't want to spend too much energy doing that. Um, and so parents need to balance their current reproduction, how much energy they're investing in this year's brood with their long-term future reproduction, investing in themselves and their longer lifespan so that they can have more opportunities to breed in future years. Um, and so I studied questions relating to this in black guillemots. Uh, black guillemots are alcids. They're related to puffins. They're socially monogamous, um, but they are uh, semi-colonial nesters, at least here on the Isles of Shoals. They're, they nest in rock crevices, and their typical clutch size is two eggs, unlike other alcids, which often just have one. Um, and they, uh, they lay their eggs towards late May, early June, and they end up hatching in early July. They also have a circumpolar range, um, and we are actually at the southern tip of it. We're not even on this range map um, on birds of the world. So this makes it really interesting to study them here specifically because we can learn about how a warmer temperatures and warmer climate might be impacting their breeding behavior. Um, so the oceans are warming, the climate is warming, especially in the circumpolar range. And so I'm also interested in what this means for Arctic and subarctic species. And one thing that happens with climate change is that it ex exacerbates the costs that they are already facing in terms of uh, what they have to deal with when they are breeding. So my main questions that I wanted to ask in this talk are uh, qu simply quantifying black guillemot investment in parental care, um, because we don't know as much that much about them really, especially here on the Isle of, Isles of Shoals. And how does parental care affect nest success? Um, and we actually established, so my hypothesis for the second question is that increased parental care would lead to increased chick growth, which seems pretty uh, logical. Um, we established, um, uh, Yuna and I established this research project on the Isles of Shoals. So when we started, we had some information on previous nest sites, but together over the period of like two months, we found 31 nests. We found them in six main locations both on Appledore Island and Smutty Nose Island. Um, yeah, and uh, nest searching involves 
uh, pretty arduous tasks of looking under rock crevices. Because guillemots don't actually build their nests, they just lay, lay their eggs on the bare rock. In order to find a nest, you actually have to find the eggs. And so this is a picture of one of the nests on Smutty Nose with its uh, four letter code. Um, and that's me looking in the rock crevice and that's a photo of what the nest looks like inside. So when the chicks hatch, we also measured wing length, weight, and culmin. And these measurements, culmin is the length of the bill. Um, and these measurements are important for understanding how fast they're growing and also for us to be able to tell how old they are if we uh, missed when they first hatched. We also painted their toenails. Um, and this was used to maintain hatch order. So if we knew which one was bigger when it hatched, we painted its toenails red. Um, and that was so that we could um, standardize the measurements across several uh, periods of time. So as they grew, we knew which individual we were measuring. Um, and then sometimes if we didn't know hatch order, we just arbitrarily assigned it. So you can see this chick had uh, light blue uh, nails. So this is an example of one of the neighborhoods that we were surveying. Um, and to study behavior, to go back to my original questions, I actually um, set up trail cameras looking at the nest. And so you can see my setup in Transect 24-2 on the left and Transect 24-1 on the right. Um, and this is another example of a setup on, in one of my nests. And you can see where I put the camera and this is the video that it took. Uh, Guillemot squeak. Um, and so uh, the cameras I use more specifically are motion activated camera traps. Um, and so they have a motion sensor, a camera and um, infrared LED lights for night vision. And so I can, using these cameras, I can actually monitor them, the nest over a 24 hour period, which is important for looking at nest visitation rates. Um, I took 20 second videos um, just so I could get the maximum amount of behavior after the, the motion is sensed. And I did 29 deployments and I had 30 to 999 videos per deployment. So there was a huge range in the amount of motion that they were capturing. Not all videos had guillemots in them, but a lot of them did. So back to my question, what is the level of black guillemot investment in parental care? Um, first, you kind of have to know what a visit is because I was quantifying this in terms of visits to the nest. And so I looked at um, arrival, presence and departure. And so you can see when they're going into the nest on the left, this would be, I would probably classify that as presence. Um, and then if it's, if it's leaving the nest, um, then that's a departure. And each, each sort of event only had um, one classification. And so I added these up to get the total number of activity that's happening at the nest. Um, so how long do parents spend at the nest? Uh, I have found that so I only looked at five of my total of 29 deployments because video analysis takes a lot of time. And we spent most of the time this summer actually establishing the project and doing the field work and collecting measurements. Um, but this is a comparison between two of my nests. And I found that um, when one nest was in the egg stage, they spent uh, more or less longer at, in the, inside the nest than when they were arriving to when, the nest, uh, when there were chicks in the nest, sorry. Um, and this is not significant, but this is just a comparison between two nests. So I expect this to be um, an indication of like how they are prioritizing care when they're incubating versus when they're feeding. Yeah. Um, so how often do parents visit? So I found that visiting rate is not really that different between the nests. Some nests have more variability than others, um, but this shows nest visits per hour. Um, and this is the nest ID. So if you think back to Mike's little quiz, um, you can actually see that they probably actually visit around one time per hour, but not all of the visits actually uh, are feeding events. So not all of them bring food at these visits. And I'll bring that up later. I also wanted to ask, does investment change with chick age? Um, and I found like a nearly significant correlation, which is pretty good for a sample size of five nests. Um, and so visiting age slightly decreases non-significantly with age, which is kind of a interesting result because you would expect them to be visiting more as the chicks grow and get bigger. Um, and one thing I was thinking is that perhaps um, if they're 
like I, this is, this leaves a lot of open questions and I'm interested in seeing what this graph looks like when, once I've analyzed all 29 uh, deployments, but they might just want to spend more time um, checking on the nest and visiting when they're incubating than when they're out looking for food. Looking at nest visit frequency with time of day, I found pretty much a, a typical bimodal distribution. So there's a lot of visits in the morning and then slightly fewer, but also a little hump in the evening. And then moving on to my second question, how does parental care affect chip growth rate? So of the five uh, deployments that I analyzed uh, for this presentation, three of them, I, we had um, chick uh, measurements that we were able to calculate using um, their weight and also um, their wing measurements because some chicks, they're so far back into the crevice that you can't actually grab them. And so it's more difficult to do that. And so this is a kind of a preliminary graph and I haven't found a relationship between visit rate and chick growth, which is interesting because if this holds true over the larger data set, that could indicate that there's actually not a huge benefit to visiting the nest more often in terms of your reproductive success. And so um, it'd be interesting to find out if guillemots, like if there's a reason for them showing up so often to some nests and not others, um, or whether it's sort of less adaptive to do that and if they'll be decreasing their nest visits um, as they evolve. So some challenges that I experienced with the, this um, data collection system. So I was kind of piloting this data with the trail cams. And one of the things that I was finding is that because they're motion activated, sometimes the birds will fly into the nest more quickly than the camera is able to capture them. And so um, I noticed a slight mismatch in the number of arrivals that I was seeing with the number of departures. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so this, you would expect that arrivals would equal departures if they're capturing everything. So this indicates that the cameras uh, might not be capturing everything. And so I think it, this depends on the camera field of view, the position and the motion sensor delay, which is about five seconds. Um, future questions that I'm really interested in studying with this data set, because we have videos, now I can go back through them and recomb through them for behavioral analysis and ask a bunch of interesting questions. So what are parents doing when they aren't feeding? A lot of times they'll just show up and squeak at each other. Um, and so I wonder if they're coordinating communication in that way. Do they synchronize nest visits across neighborhoods? I've seen multiple guillemots fly up towards the nest at the same time. Um, individual parental identification. We were, we were unable to ban adults this season, um, but I've noticed when I'm looking at the videos that I can sometimes tell them apart based on how uh, their non-breeding plumage is coming in in those white spots on the wing patches. And so I'd be interested in trying to do that across the data set. And also looking at how they time nest visits because that has to do with predator avoidance. Um, sometimes, they'll, sometimes birds will synchronize their nest visits so that they reduce the chances of predators finding the nest. So I'm interested in asking questions about that. Um, so takeaways, black gill not parental care investment may depend on nest stage and chick age. Um, and future study on this population of black guillemots will help us understand long-term trends. And this is a screenshot from one of my videos. <laughs> so for my acknowledgements, I wanna thank Yuna, who is my amazing field partner. And we honestly could not have done this on our own. So it was great to work with you. Um, Lenny and Rai for field assistance, um, Liz, Craig, Gemma, Lucas for all of your mentorship. Um, Teresa and Olivia for also coming out with us. Mike Sigler, David and Jen um, for all of your support and the boat captains for the inflatable surveys because one of the ways we were looking for nests is going out onto the water and watching them fly in and out. Um, and Ferry Smutty Nose. All the Shoals Marine Lab Island staff and the Marine Coastal Island National Wildlife Refuge where we were um, on Smutty Nose. Uh, setting the nest, and then also my fellow surges. Thank you. Well, we have time for one question. Got to have it. What is it? Right. Um, you mentioned that uh, some of them are often. Why do you think some of them go out more often than others? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there, the question. Yeah, okay. The question was, 
some some guillemots I've observed seeing them visit a lot, but that might not be in, increasing the chick success or the nest success. And so why is that? Um, and I don't know, that's a really interesting question to me because in the videos I can watch them at the nest and what they're doing. And a lot of time they will just sit there in front of it. Um, sometimes they will squeak at each other so they'll communicate. So I think it might be a combination of um, like inter-parent negotiations or that like I can't understand currently or um, nest vigilance. So they might just be watching out for predators. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in learning about more of those behavioral dynamics that have less to do with feeding and just more to do with like colony interactions and things like that. Great, thanks, Willa. Thank you. So next up is Una Park, Willa's uh, Gilly's partner in crime. Uh, and Yuna from Cornell University. Um, hi, my name is Yuna Park. Um, I am a rising senior at Cornell University studying animal science, and I am the other seabird ecology intern this year. Uh, and today I'll be presenting on nest site selection and breeding success in black yellow moths. So you've already heard plenty about black yellow moths from Willow, but here's a quick refresher on them. So they are alcids or from the family Alcidae, meaning they're related to puffins. Um, they are Northern ranging circumpolar birds, meaning they're typically found in Arctic and subarctic regions. And as Willow said, the Isle of Shoals is actually the furthest south they go. So that's pretty interesting. Um, they are shallow water feeders and mostly eat small intertidal fish such as rock gunnel and invertebrates. Yeah. Now I'm sure that most of you here in Appledore today have seen our gulls around. Um, you may have also seen their nests scattered around. Um, for those of you not on the island today, gulls are ground nesters, so they will choose a territory for the breeding season and build their nests in an open area on the ground. Um, on the other hand, black moths nest in rock crevices. They typically nest in rocky areas close to the shoreline, so near their feeding grounds. Um, and they don't build their nests or modify their environments in any way. They lay their eggs directly on the ground inside the nest crevices. Um, this is something I became curious about when we were searching for their nests, which was often a difficult affair. At the same time, I began thinking about the differences between birds such as the gulls, which change or modify their environment in order to make their nest, and birds that rely on finding a suitable environment that's already there, like our black gill ones. Um, this makes their potential nesting habitats much more limited, um, as you can see from the fact that the gulls nest throughout Appledore. You can just go walk around and see many of them. Um, as opposed to the guillemots, which are clustered around the edge of the island. Um, you can think of it as something like this. So imagine that you are a black guillemot and imagine that you are house hunting. You need a nest in order to protect your beautiful eggs. Um, if you wanted to raise these eggs into surviving functional adults, um, where would you choose to live? This clean, well-built, um, dry house or this damp, probably full of black mold, crumbling house? Um, which one would best protect your eggs from nosy neighbors and bad weather? This is the basic concept of nest site selection. So it sounds pretty straightforward. Birds when they're building their nests, they need to choose a particular location for their nest out of all the possible sites. And this choice can have important consequences for their breeding success, such as with respect to predation risk or exposure to elements. So some factors that can affect nest site selection are proximity of feeding sites, and again, shelter and protection, as well as camouflage from predators. So this is actually an example of one of our nests um, in Transect 24. Um, and as you can see, this nest is pretty well concealed. 
you can't really tell exactly where it is. Um, and it's well enclosed except for at the entrance. You can, these are, this is a picture of the eggs inside, but you can only see it if you're like really looking for it. Um, so that brought me to my main question, which was what affects nest site selection in breeding black guillemots? Um, and I had several sub questions for this. So my first was, what are the descriptive characteristics of nest sites selected by black guillemots? Um, and these are some of my factors. So firstly, for entrance size and number, black guillemots aren't small birds. They're about a foot long, but on Appledore, they are smaller than most of the other breeding birds here. Um, in particular, they overlap in breeding territory a lot with the gulls. Um, and gulls are predators and will often predate on eggs and chicks of other birds. Um, I'll be talking more about this later, but so I hypothesized that in a nest site, a black guillemot would be looking for an entrance that's big enough for it to fit in, but like small enough that other birds wouldn't be able to get in and predate on chicks. Um, this similar principle for a number of entrances, um, while that make, might make it easier to access their eggs and chicks, it could also mean more ways for a predator to get in. So I hypothesize that most would have maybe limited to one or two entrances. Um, for elevation above water, uh, because they are nesting so close to shore, I was, I hypothesized that um, they would want their nests at a certain height above the water so that they weren't at risk of flooding or like at high tide or in, during inclement weather, um, but within a certain elevation band, so not high enough that they were encroaching in other birds' territories, such as the blackback gulls. Um, for an angle of entrance relative to sea, because the parents are making frequent foraging trips in order to, to provision their chicks, I hypothesize that um, it would their entrances would mostly be facing or like near the sea. Um, I also looked at proximity to other black guillemot nests. So like many seabirds, black guillemots have a show a degree of coloniality. So they'll tend to nest in small groups at, at the very least. Um, and while many colonial birds will show uh, intraspecific territoriality, um, I was wondering if the presence of other black guillemots might act as an indicator of good nest sites. Um, so I hypothesized that they would be found, find, they would be found within um, proximity to each other, close proximity to each other. And finally, the one that I was actually excited for the most was proximity to herring gull nests. So as I mentioned earlier on, uh, herring gulls are predators. And in fact, they are generalist predators, so they'll eat pretty much anything they can get their bills on. Um, and that includes the eggs and chicks of other birds. Um, in addition to that, they display kleptoparasitism, where they will often chase down and attack other birds in order to steal their food, like this puffin here. Um, so to me, that seems like pretty straightforward, like they would be pretty bad neighbors, right? <laughs> If I were a black guillemot, I would not necessarily want one next to me. But what was interesting was that wasn't what we were seeing out in the field when we were looking for nests. While we were nest searching, we found that many guillemot nests were seemed to be in association with herring gull nests. Like they were very close. There's one example where a bird even flew directly over a herring gull in order to get it to its nest. Um, and I was wondering, if herring gulls are such bad neighbors, then why, if there was no benefit to nesting close to them, why would black guillemots? So I hypothesized that maybe herring gull proximity um, was a good way to protect their chicks from other bigger predators, such as the blackback gulls. Yeah. So my question is, are they good neighbors or are they bad neighbors? <laughs> Um, that brings me to my second sub question, which is how do nest characteristics affect breeding success in black guillemots? Um, and I hypothesize that certain nest characteristics would be associated with increased success. Um, and 
breeding success can be kind of like a nebulous thing. Um, usually it's the number of chicks that are successfully fledged in a season or over the time of a bird's life. Um, but as we, as our time frame is quite short and we're not able to actually see all of our nest fledging, um, I used a proxy measurement for this. So the proxy I used was weight over wing of the oldest chick in the nest within its linear growth rate. So that's kind of a lot. So um, wing, we found that wing tended to grow in a linear way up to a certain day. So day 10 approximately. Um, and as a measure of body size, there is some variability between chicks um, of like the same age. So a good way, I decided that a way to control for body size would be to put the weight over the wing um, so that we would have, we would be able to compare chicks that were found on different days, um, but still within this linear growth period. Um, so this was a way to standardize it. Yeah, and then my third sub-question was, are earlier establishment dates associated um, with certain nest characteristics? And or, uh, are earlier establishment dates associated with, sorry, with more successful nests? Um, I hypothesize that nest sites with an earlier establishment date would have increased success and that um, the nest sites with the, aforementioned successful characteristics would also have an earlier establishment date. Um, so the reason why I thought this was as the guillemots, as I said, are looking for cavities with, or are limited to the existing cavities on Appledore, um, I thought that earlier arriving birds would get their first pick basically. Um, so I hypothesized that they would go for nests that would give them increased breeding success. Yeah, so for my methods, um, I'm bringing this picture back, but in order to find our chick measurements, we had to go find the chicks um, and do some measurements. So as Willow mentioned, we measured wing, culmin, weight. Um, so this is just an example of how you can see these chicks growing. Um, for my nest entrance size, these are some examples of pictures that I took and measured using image J. And this seems straightforward, but this also required some level of digging around. Yeah, um, I used this map to find elevation above sea. And onto my results. Uh, so these were the mean characteristics of the nest that I found on Appledore. Um, I don't have much time to go into this, but one of the interesting ones um, was, to me, was um, elevation above sea. So there's kind of like a good scattering there. Um, and you, uh, as you'll see in my next slides, these actually have pretty interesting associations with my other characteristics. Um, so first, the angle of entrance relative to sea. Um, I found that these nests tended to be facing very close to sea and that, as you can see, many of them were clustered around this way. So that was, this was statistically, statistically significant, which I thought was interesting. So that supported my hypothesis that they would be associated with the sea. Um, this was my comparison of the weight over wing measurement and establishment date. So this, so my hypothesis was not supported. Um, this shows that there might be a trend of a positive trend between establishment date and weight over, and breeding success. So later nests actually seem to have a little higher success. This might be due to sample size as we don't have firm establishment dates for many nests. Um, but it would be something I'd be interested in looking into further. Um, so these were so, like some of my nest characteristics against establishment date and weight over wing. Um, as you can see, there's not much of a trend for most of them, except for um, elevation above sea versus weight over wing. So I found this very interesting because I actually thought that like 
higher elevation would show higher success, but that's not the case. As you can see here, um, it's like the result is almost significant, but it shows a trend um, between lower elevation and success. Yeah. Um, and for my distances to other species and for, for my distances to other black guillemot nests and also to herd nests, um, there also isn't much of a trend between establishment date and these characteristics. But for distance to herring gull nests and weight over wing, there is actually a surprisingly strong trend. And again, this did not support my hypothesis, but it was still very exciting. Um, so this showed me that nests that were closely associated with herring gull nests actually showed much lower breeding success. Um, and there's a number of possible reasons for this. Uh, firstly, as I said, because herring gulls are kleptoparasites, um, it's possible that the competition pressure with black guillemots is affecting the chicks. So when black guillemots come in with prey, they might not be able to feed their chicks because herring gulls are attacking and stealing their food. Um, that actually goes for elevation above sea as well. Um, the higher the higher elevation the nest, the further they have to fly um, and possibly go through many herring gulls territories. Um, so that's poss that's probably that that is a factor that I would definitely like to look more into in the future. Yeah. So in conclusion, herring gulls are bad neighbors for a myriad of reasons. Yeah. So. Yeah, as I said, this is probably due to competition pressure, but I also thought it was interesting that establishment date did not show a relationship with any of our nest, any of my nest characteristics. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, this is possibly due to um, the fact that black guillemots show nest site fidelity. So that means that they'll tend to return to their same nest sites every year. Um, and so I, I, a possible reason for this lack of relationship is that rather than looking for the ideal nest site for them, they are finding a nest site when they first begin to breed here and then just sticking with it year after year. Yeah. So why does this matter? Well, as Willow said, we've been establishing a monitoring project on these birds and it's important to be able to narrow down what characteristics are common in black guillemot nests um, in order to be able to find more of them in the future and monitor their populations. Um, in addition, it's also good to just understand what makes a good nest for them and what's not. Uh, this can be really helpful when um, developing a restoration or conservation plan for them. Uh, there are actually plans to maybe establish a colony of black guillemots on White Island nearby, so where the terns are. And one really good thing about that island is that there are no herring gulls there. Yeah, so just some future directions and some questions that I didn't get to. Um, one thing that I would have loved to do is evaluate characteristics of empty crevices. So like crevices where there are no nesting guillemots and see if they are differing from the nests that we do have. Um, I'm curious about if potential nest sites are a limiting factor for these populations. Um, I'd also like to just expand on more of the characteristics that I did look at, such as elevation of sea. Um, I would also love to identify adults because in the future, I'd love to see if site fidelity is what's influencing um, the lack of relationship I saw between establishment date and nest characteristics. Um, I'd also love to see the differences between neighborhoods as well as monitor nests through fledging if I get um, if I get the opportunity to. It was a little frustrating to be so constrained with time and not know for sure whether our chicks are gonna fledge. Yeah, so my acknowledgements. Firstly, I'd like to thank my field partner, Willow. I could not have done it without her. Um, I'd like to thank my mentors, Liz Craig and Gemma Klukas for just all of their amazing mentorship, I guess. Uh, I'd also like to thank Lenny Laird and Rye Androok for 
their field support throughout this whole endeavor. Um, I'd like to thank Mike, Dave, and Jen for their support for this whole program. My fellow surges, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Um, the SML staff, they've just like kept us alive this whole season. <laughs> And finally, the Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge um, for letting us on their island to poke around. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're over time. So for your questions at UNA at the grave for during lunch. Good job. Um, I don't know how the speaker works. Yeah. So bear with us a moment. Chloe Fugel of Dartmouth College is the next speaker. And she unfortunately got COVID when she was off the island. Sorry. Uh, remotely. Chloe, can you try saying something? Hello. Who's coming on there? Try again. Hello. Testing. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. Worked last night. Yeah, I, I wasn't the one who said it up last night. Yeah, we just plugged it in. Yeah. Hi, honey. Okay, the volume's now about half speed. Wait, Chloe, can you uh, say something? Hello, hello. I just plugged it in. Work. If you press the same thing again, I just end up for you. Hello, testing one, two, three. They're coming from these kids. They're still testing, testing. Is that the right one? The headphones, right? Yep, yeah, sounds great. Right. Try again, Chloe. Testing one, two, three. How about now? Hello. 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 Hi, Chloe. Hello, everybody. Okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, where did that go? Oh, All right. Go big, Chloe. All right. Are we good? That'll work. Awesome. Uh, So Chloe Fugel from uh, Dartmouth College, and um, you changed the. Uh, oh. You, oh yeah. Can you all see that? You're looking good, Chloe. Awesome. So nice to be back, uh, even virtually. And today I want to talk to you about variation in roseate turn fledging success across CV Island. So roseate terns are a federally endangered species and they CB Island, New Hampshire, which is about five minutes from Appledore, hosts a large breeding population of roseate terns, which are managed to uh, hopefully help increase the population size and maybe eventually remove the roseates from the federally endangered species list. In addition, terns and other seabirds are indicator species for ocean health, for ocean health. And they're important because unlike marine mammals or fish, they nest on land in large numbers, and so they're easy for scientists to access and study. Um, I did a primarily data analysis project, but before I talk about my data analysis, I want to talk about the methods used to collect the data. So on CV Island, roseate turn chicks are abandoned and monitored between their hatch day and day and when they are five days old. Once they are five days old, they can no longer be monitored because they are highly mobile and very hard to catch. And so roseate turn chicks are considered fledged at day five. 
um, I use chick banding data from 2017 to 2021 in my analysis. In addition to monitoring uh, roseate chicks, adult roseate terns are monitored by neighborhood on CV Island. So as you can see in the image on the right, uh, the neighborhoods are uh, numbered one through nine are high density clusters of nests. And adults that are banded uh, anywhere and recited by scientists on CB Island can be matched to a large roseate turn database to determine their age and birth location. Additionally, turns that were born on CB Island since 2017 and recited can be matched to the neighborhood they were born in. And I used adult recite data from 2017 to 2022 for my analysis. So it's important to uh, know what kind of differences in environment affect roseate term reproductive success because uh, we want to manage them for high uh, roseate term reproductive success. And um, so I wanted to look at what some of the major differences were between different areas of CV Island and if they affected uh, roseate success. And so the way I did that was I looked at the differences between neighborhoods. I also wanted to see if there were other factors that had a bigger impact on roseate success than variation between neighborhoods, such as weather. Uh, before I get into uh, the real data analysis, I wanted to look, I wanted to explain um, my measure of roseate term reproductive success. So typically, um, fledging success is measured with in productivity, which is the number of chicks fledged per nest. And I also looked at the percent of chicks fledged, which is the number of chicks uh, fledged per number of eggs. So each of these points is a neighborhood. And as you can see, this point circled in red has a productivity of one. So this neighborhood um, had an average of one chick fledged per nest. But uh, the percent fledged is one half, which means that this neighborhood had an average of two eggs in each nest. Uh, the points above this one have uh, fewer uh, eggs per nest than the points circled in red. And so percent fledged might be a more sensitive indicator of how the bee chicks, so the later chicks, are uh, surviving and therefore could be a more sensitive indicator of uh, roseate reproductive success. So uh, this first, I wanted to look at how roseates varied in their percent fledge between neighborhoods. And I found that there wasn't any difference in their percent fledge between neighborhoods. However, this may be due to a small sample size. Each of the neighborhoods only has five years of data. I also looked to see how turn age, adult turn age varied between neighborhood. Um, and I looked at all of the turns across all five years. And I found that there was no difference in adult turn age between neighborhood except for neighborhood one, which was older than some of the other neighborhoods. Then I also wanted to look at other factors such as weather. I mainly looked at uh, uh, that could have a bigger impact on uh, roseate success than the variations between neighborhoods. And I mainly looked at temperature because I also wanted to look at precipitation. Unfortunately, there's not enough precipitation data uh, to do an analysis. So uh, with temperature, I looked at the number of extreme cold and hot days and saw how uh, that affected the percent fledged in the year. So each of these points is one year. And how I define an extreme cold day is that uh, all, it would be a day where both the high and the low were within the 10th percentile of all days between 2017 and 2022 that had the, um, of the temperature, all the, it was in the 10th percentile of temperature in the breeding season between 2017 and 2022. And then a cold spell would be number, the number of extreme cold days in a row. And as you can see, there does seem to be a downward trend between the length of cold spell and number of extreme cold days and percent fledged. However, there's not really enough data to uh, form any strong conclusions. Similarly, I looked at the length of the longest hot spell and number of extreme heat days where an extreme heat day would be where both the high and the low was in the 90th percentile. And similarly, there does seem to be a downward trend um, between percent fledge and longest hot spell and extreme heat days, but there's not really enough data to tell. So 
I found that there were no differences in flood rates between neighborhoods, and there weren't really any differences in ages between neighborhoods. And I would love to do the uh, weather analysis again at about 15 or 20 years and see if the downward trend uh, does actually result in a difference in percent fledged. So I also uh, looked at if there were differences in the composition of adult turns between neighborhoods. And two questions I had were if the neighborhoods varied in their percentage of locally born adults and also if locally born, so born on CB Island, adults tended to return to the neighborhood they were born in. Before I did that, I wanted to see if there were any biases towards certain neighborhoods in the um, percent of adults in that neighborhood that were recited. And this uh, graph shows the, that the number of recites, so the number of adults that were recited in a neighborhood increases with the number of nests in the neighborhood, which is an expected result. I also wanted to see if the percentage of birds that were recited in a neighborhood varied by neighborhood. And I found that uh, some neighborhoods like neighborhood four had a much higher percentage of birds recited than other neighborhoods like neighborhood three, five, and seven. I also checked to see if this was correlated with the size of the neighborhood. So these numbers across the top show the average nest size, uh, sorry, the average nest number across all five years, and I found that there was not a correlation. Um, so, sorry, uh, keeping, so keeping that there might be some bias towards uh, uh, the adults recited in some neighborhoods in mind, I looked to see if there were variations in uh, locally born adults, in the percentage of locally born adults between neighborhoods. This graph is showing um, adults that are coming from every uh, roseate colony uh, from Massachusetts, New York, Maine, and New Hampshire, and that have come and nested on CB Island. And each of the neighborhoods, uh, each of these bars have data from all, it's all of the adults from all five years, because the years aren't independent, because adults can come back and uh, nest in the same neighborhood year after year. And uh, with the exception of neighborhood seven, which only has one adult uh, that was recited and matched back to the database, I found that uh, all of the neighborhoods had a majority of locally born turns. And then I also wanted to look to see if adults tended to return to the neighborhood that they were born in. And so these are the 26 adults that have been born and banded on CV since uh, 2017 and that have come back to CV and nested in a neighborhood and were recited in that neighborhood. And I, although there's not really enough data to draw any conclusions about the differences between neighborhoods, I was surprised by how many adult turns did not return to the neighborhood they were born in and rather uh, chose to nest in a different neighborhood. So I found that the percent of birds recited varies by neighborhood and that that should just, that the results that follow should be taken with a grain of salt because of this. And I also found that there is some variation in the percentage of locally, locally born turns between neighborhoods, but that all neighborhoods except neighborhood seven had a majority of locally born turns. And finally, I also um, looked at the differences between neighborhoods in the tendency of adult turns to return, return to the neighborhood they were born in. And I found that a surprisingly large, large number of turns did not return to the neighborhood. In terms of future directions, I would love to do redo all of this analysis in about 15 or 20 years when there is a lot more data for the colony and see if things like weather, uh, percent fledged, number of adults, and adults that have returned, um, that were born on CB and have returned, if those data change uh, or if some of the trends that we've started to see in this data hold uh, with a lot more data. And then I would like to thank Dr. Celia Chen for her amazing mentorship throughout this project and Dr. Liz Craig for sharing all the turn data, welcoming me onto White and CV Island and for all her help interpreting the data. I'd also like to thank Mike, Dave and Jen for uh, all their help throughout the internship and making the CERG program run smoothly. 
and the Shoals Marine Lab Dartmouth College and Bill for location and funding for the project. And also a huge thank you to all my fellow SURG interns and the SML staff for making the internship a wonderful experience. Um, that's my presentation. Any questions? So we have time for some questions for Chloe. Gary. I can't hear the question. So Chloe, what Carrie asked is to elaborate on neighborhoods and the choices birds make in coming back to one neighborhood versus another. Sorry, could you repeat that? Carrie. You want to yeah. Yeah, just come on up. It'd be simpler. Hey, Chloe. Sorry. Hello. Could you talk more about um, what the differences are between the neighborhoods, both in terms of the abiotic characteristics and also whether birds have preferences for hanging out near the same birds year after year? So Thanks. I don't know. Um, in terms of abiotic characteristics, the neighborhoods can vary in vegetation. Um, I that was one of my original questions. I did not end up doing an analysis, but so grass uh, roseate turns like nest in a specific height of grass and the neighborhoods can vary in terms of the amount of like grass versus rock they are in the neighborhoods and also roseate terns um, always nest near common terns and there are a lot of common terns on the island as well. And so the neighborhoods can vary in uh, like proximity to common turn nests and density of common turn nests. And those are also some future questions that I have. Other questions? Yeah, right. Right, you want to just come up and with that question? Hi, Chloe. Um, I was just wondering if uh, the number of birds that are from other colonies um, or like were banded elsewhere, is there a correlation between how far away they are and how many there are on the island? I haven't done that analysis. Um, that's something I actually am going to do sometime this week because I'm curious, but I think that there is um, this Stratton Island that's, I'm pretty sure that's the a main colony and it's like the next closest colony. And um, I did a, like an analysis by state, the same graph by state, uh, just to kind of look at distance. And there was definitely like a significant drop off by the Massachusetts and New York states. Uh, the colonies in those states were all, they had a much smaller percentage of birds. Oh, cool, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Chloe. That was great job. Chloe, great job. Thank you. So next up is uh, Ryan Andrew, who's a student at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, you kind of have to have it. Do you want it on the top or the bottom? I think that's I don't know if I can move it. Yeah, just remember your answer to this question. Okay. It's not me. It's you. <laughs> Divorce in great black back gulls, Laris Marinus on Appledore Island. Uh, so before I tell you a little bit about Divorce, I'm gonna tell you a bit about the species that I studied and um, the banding project that made this data collection possible. So I'm sure as you've noticed, there's a lot of birds here. And if you're on Zoom, there's a lot of birds here. <laughs> um, the main two species that we have are the great blackback gulls and the herring gulls. The blackbacks are a bit bigger and they're black on their wings and the herring gulls are a bit smaller and have gray. They're both colonial nesting seabirds, uh, which means they nest in large groups with the same or similar species. Um, and so here is a map of their nesting locations across the island. Uh, this is from 2018, but it's pretty similar to how they nest um, every year and this year. And you'll notice that um, the same species tend to cluster together. So the great blackback gulls are those uh, black circles that tend to be closer to other blackbacks and their herring gulls closer to other herring gulls. Uh, this is because they 
pick a territory with their mate and um, defend it pretty heavily, which you'll learn a lot more about later from Kayla. <laughs> so this is a graph from the um, Gull census that the field ornithology class led by Kristen Covino does every year. And this is just to give you a sense um, that their overall population is declining, in both herring gulls and blackbacks. So the great blackback gull, move this down. Uh, they are the world's largest gull. They're very, very big. Uh, they have a wingspan of over five feet and their mass is about five pounds, whereas the herring gull's wingspan um, is about four and, a half feet, four and a half feet and their mass is about three and a half pounds. Uh, the great blackback gulls primarily feed on fish and other sea critters, but they're very opportunistic as you've heard in some other talks. Um, and they mate by picking one partner and um, setting up a nest and laying eggs and defending their chicks and feeding them throughout the breeding season. So the Gulls of Appledore project was started in 2004 by Dr. Julie Ellis when she began banding herring gulls and great blackback gulls uh, during her doctoral research. And then the coordination of the project was taken over in 2017 by Sarah Corshane and Mary Elizabeth Everett. Uh, since the start of the project, they've banded over 5,000 birds, um, both species, but now they only band, band blackbacks. Um, and they also have over 27,000 recites. And a recite is when an observer sees one of our banded birds somewhere and tells us about it, like the location and the time and the activity of the bird. So the birds are banded um, at two different times during the season. Uh, in the earlier part of the season, they're banded on their nests. Um, so a big scary looking metal tap is placed over um, their nests with eggs in it and their drive for incubation is just so strong that they'll ignore how terrifying it looks and walk right in. Um, and then chicks are also banded later in the season and we basically just catch them by chasing them around like chickens. <laughs> and um, once we have a bird, they are, outfitted with um, a plastic fuel readable band, which is on the right up here, and a um, metal federal band. And these both have a unique combination of letters and numbers to identify the birds as individuals. Uh, so this is Tui Tu. He is one of the birds that we know the most about because he is banded. He was banded in 2006 as an adult uh, which means he's at least 20 years old today. He was genetically sexed as male and he has over 300 recites in our database. And through these recites, we've learned a lot about him, uh, like his foraging habits. This picture here, he's eating a skate. Um, we have a lot of pictures sent in um, by bird lovers. So we also know a lot about his um, wintering sites. He turn, tends to return to Parker River National Wildlife Refuge year after year, um, which is pretty close to here, but he has very high wintering site fidelity. So we also know a lot about his family history since he's banded. He has at least 10 recorded nests on Appledore. Um, and through recites, we found out that he provides extended parental care to his chicks. Um, so he'll continue feeding them like over at Parker River uh, well beyond fledging. We also know um, that he has at least two different recorded mates. We usually um, are using banding to see the birds as individuals, but oftentimes you'll see them with another bird um, who is usually their mate. So what makes a marriage? <laughs> um, maybe love, patience, communication. It's probably similar in gulls. Um, they share a lot of similarities to humans. They both share in the housekeeping, uh, the breadwinning, the child care, or in gull terms, um, that's incubation and defending the nest. And then once the chicks are hatched, they are very, very cute. So they defend them very aggressively and they are very good parents. Um, and they both forage for and feed the chicks, um, even when they're giant and the same size as them. So gulls were originally thought to mate for life, um, as Mike gave you a little preview of before. Um, from National Geographic and Birds of the World, um, it says that pair bond is maintained over multiple seasons and possibly for life. And there's no data on the percentage of pairs that break the pair bond. 
So breaking the pair bond um, means divorce. And divorce is just when both partners survive and nest again the next year with different mates and they're reported as such. So my big question that I wanted to answer is what influences great black bat gold divorce? But in order to do that, I need to first find out uh, what their divorce rates are and if they differ from year to year. So to do this, I needed banded birds and marked nests. Um, I looked through the database from 2010 to 2022, and there's a lot of birds in there. So if we have a banded bird that's tied to a specific nest and another banded bird that's also tied to that nest, I know that they are mates. And then the way that I found divorce, um, I'll give you a little example. So here we have two and mate and five and five who are in love and happy in 2012. And then, oh no, you guessed it, they divorced between 2012 and 2013. So now is the question, does two and mate ever find love again? Yes, <laughs> the next year in 2013, um, two and mate mates with six EL. So I looked through the database and I analyzed a bunch of pairs between 2010 and 2022. And I found a total of 207 recorded pairs um, and some of them divorced and some of them did not. And keep in mind that um, we originally thought that gulls mate for life. And I found that the percentage of divorce ranged from 24% in two, 2011, all the way up to 72% in 2019. So I'm sure you're all thinking, what the heck happened in 2019? So I don't really know the answer to that question, um, but I wanted to find out. Um, so what likely causes divorce? A lot of people think that it may be based on nest failure. So if their eggs um, don't hatch or their chicks die, they might nest again with a new partner. Um, but people in the project have looked at that in the past and there's just been too much variation. Sometimes we'll like observe a pair failing year after year and they stay together and keep trying. Others will successfully um, fledge chicks and then break up and try new mates next year. And so some reasons for this may be um, a mismatch in arrival time. So this is when one bird gets there earlier in the season and then the other bird gets there a bit later. So they didn't get to the island at the same time. So they might pick a different mate if their mate is not there. So now that I know that divorce rates do vary by year, I wanna see like what else is influencing them. So going back to that mismatches in arrival time, I read a study about albatross and these are birds that do typically actually mate for life or have very longer um, partnerships. And this study showed that their divorce rates tend to be higher when the ocean temperatures are warmer. And the rationale behind this is that uh, they, have lower access to their prey um, when the ocean temperatures are hotter and um, this affects their physiology. So then the next year when they're arriving to the uh, breeding site, they don't get there at the same time as their mate. So I wanted to see if this was true in gulls as well. So I looked at um, average water temperature from April, May, and June um, from the Jeffrey's Ledge buoy. And I didn't really find much of a relationship there. Um, there's nothing significant so I also looked at um, a one year delay to see if the previous breeding season um, prey availability had an effect as well as a two and a three year delay. And um, that was thinking more about the age of the fish that they could be eating if the fish are like one, two or three years old. And I found no real relationship there. So if divorce rates are not influenced by ocean temperatures, what else could be influencing them? I was thinking that if their population sizes are larger overall, um, when they arrive on the island and their mate isn't there, um, if there's a lot of other birds around, might not wait that long for their mate to arrive. They might just pick another mate. So I looked at that relationship and I also found no correlation um, with a correlation coefficient of 0 0.11. There's nothing significant there. So um, some future research that would be really interesting to look at um, are specifically like the arrival dates but these gulls get here in the end of March or beginning of April, no one's here then. Um, so we can use establishment dates, which is uh, when the first egg is laid in the nest as a proxy for their arrival. Uh, so my thought was if a pair divorced um, and they get here at different times and they have two different nests, that those nests should have different establishment dates. I was also wondering if their overwintering behavior has an influence 
on when they arrive. Um, based on recites, we know that males tend to go a bit further overwintering than females. Um, they can go all the way down to like South Carolina, uh, Florida, and furthest was seen in Mexico. Though most of our birds do tend to be um, in the local area, like Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine. So looking through the data, I found that the longest recorded partnership was actually seven years between pre-P2 and 1RO. So I'm wondering if longer partnerships are more successful than shorter partnerships, and if these really high rates of divorce are negatively affecting their success. I also found a really interesting situation with this female bird that has the band 5ER, who switched mates with four other birds in consecutive years in the same neighborhood, Celia's Garden, which is right behind you over there. Um, I was wondering if that means that birds that divorce remarry in the same neighborhood. Uh, it makes me think that birds might have higher nest site fidelity than um, fidelity to their mate. And that could have really important conservation implications um, for conserving their historical nesting sites. So some takeaways for you all, gulls divorce a lot, <laughs> and there's a lot of possible reasons for that divorce. And I really think a great place for future study to see if they have higher fidelity to the nest site and not the mate. I have a lot of thank yous uh, to Kayla Cannon, my wonderful, beautiful, amazing deal partner, um, Dylan Titmus for helping get us set up with everything gull, um, Mary Elizabeth for being an amazing mentor, um, Sarah Corshane, Kristen Covino, David Buck, Mike Ziegler, Una Willow, Lenny, Melanie, um, the Surges and the SEIs, the Shoal staff, and of course, the gulls. <laughs> Great job, Ryan. Uh, time for two questions. Liz. <laughs> Okay, so Liz is wondering how we might study um, nest fidelity and um, mate fidelity. Um, so that's a really good question. <laughs> I originally wanted to look to see if um, there's a certain distance that um, a birds move from their old nest to a new nest and see if it tends to be like lower than a certain area. Because I think their neighborhoods are defined um, pretty well, like that Celia's garden area down there. It's kind of like what you can see. So they don't go super far across the island and they do have pretty high um, natal phylopatry and that they go back to, or they think that they go back to um, right around where their nest was that they hatched. I don't know if that fully answered your question, but thank you. Any other questions? Other questions? Very. Yeah, so um, Carrie is asking if we have data on um, males versus females and like who's arriving first and who's switching territories. Yeah, um, so a lot of the birds um, haven't been genetically sexed, but we can somewhat do it by eye in pairs. Some of them look very, very similar though, and that's not like scientifically rigorous enough for a lot of things. Um, but for the ones that we have genetically sexed, and I think it's possible to have more of them sexed in the future because we do have, like when they're banded, they collect a lot of information on them. They collect like blood and feathers and other stuff as well as um, morphometric um, measurements. measurements. Um, but yeah, so some of the thought is that males may be establishing their territories first and then like the females switch around. Um, but when people in the project have looked at that in the past, there's just been too much variation. Um, and I personally think that it may have a lot more to do with the gulls as individuals, because through monitoring them this season, we got to learn that they're very individual birds. Some of them, like in the reaction to us coming after the nest, some of them will flee every single time, which seems like pretty unusual for a blackback. And others will um, swoop and attack and um, be aggressive in a similar manner, like some will stay on the ground, some will always take to, to the sky. And so I really think that it's more to do with the individuals. Thank you for your question. Jen. 
Um, and some birds that got more meat to keep me young. Mm -hmm. So that was a question that I was originally interested in. Uh, Jen was saying that in songbirds, they see a lot of mate switching earlier on. Um, I think that could entirely be possible, um, but we don't have concrete age data for a lot of them because the birds are usually banded or a bunch of them are banded as adults. They're at least four years old. So we can get an approximation of their age, but nothing exact. Uh, but I think it is possible that they that age could be a factor in um, mate switching. Although I do know one example of Tui Tui because he's very old. Um, he's had like a bunch of different mates. And I think that it like his mates could be an entirely different age than him. Um, but he does seem to be somewhat successful. You know. Are there any cases of like remating? Remating? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yuna asked if there are any cases of remating. Um, I think there have been. I don't know offhand if I saw that throughout it. Um, but I think like anecdotally there may have been. Olivia. I know at least some of them did stay in that um, area. Olivia asked if um, with Far VR who, who switched mates multiple times in the same neighborhood, if those other mates also stayed there. Um, I know one particular mate, um, previous mate was 7U9, who's a very notorious bird. Um, he was still nesting in that same area with a different mate. Did you have a question as well? So, um, so we have a question asking um, how long they live and if they're fertile throughout throughout that whole time period. Um, I think the oldest known gull is about uh, 28, but they probably live about 20 to 30 years. Um, and I'm not sure if they're fertile the whole time. I think that they may be, but that's not something that I know. Liz is shaking her head yes, nodding her head yes. <laughs> Great. Well, cool. Thanks for a great set of questions. Thanks, Ryan. And so the next event for today are the all important lunch, which is at 12 30 here. Uh, and then we will reconvene at 1 45 here for the remaining talk. I think if there's uh, any people that want to, don't have, they want to get, get around the island, have somebody show them. Yeah. Nice. Well, how is lunch? Yeah. So if it doesn't work for some reason, you would just press this button, but you should be able to fix that. So next up is Kayla and Cannon from Friends Mar College. Okay. Hello, I'm Kayla Cannon, and I'm going to be talking with you about the goals of Appledore and their double defense or their cooperative responses to threats. There we go. So here you are in Appledore Island in the Isles of Shoals in Maine. And you've probably on your way to Piggins encountered our friends, the great black backed gulls. They come here every summer to uh, lay their eggs and to raise chicks. And while they're here, they experience a conflict of needs. You're probably quite familiar with conflicts of needs in your own life. If you're a student or you've ever been a student, you've uh, certainly experienced simultaneous needs to study and to sleep. Wherever you are in life, you've probably also experienced having various everyday tasks piling up all at once. So perhaps there's a lot of laundry that needs to be folded. The house hasn't been cleaned in two weeks. It's 2 p.m. and you haven't yet made lunch. The needs that the girls experience on Appledore include incubation. They need to sit on their eggs pretty consistently for them to hatch. 
They also need to forage because everything needs to eat and eventually they need to feed their chicks. And they need to defend their nests and the nesting territories that they stake out on the island early in the season because their eggs and their chicks are quite small and vulnerable and they are in danger from a variety of predators. So when a gull is a uh, home defending, incubating, and uh, its mate is out foraging, then if a threat approaches, it has to cease incubating to defend the nest. If both gulls are home, one incubating and one simply present in the territory, if a threat approaches, the one that's present in the territory is also able to defend the nest. My question is how it might be advantageous for both mates to be present at the nest, rather than for one to incubate and for one to forage. And I have two hypotheses to look at these questions. My first is my mate presence hypothesis, which suggests that the defensive response of the incubating goal is weaker when the mate is present. So this looks at just the incubating goal. Sometimes its mate is present, sometimes it is not. And uh, it compares the responses in these two different situations. My second hypothesis, I'm calling the cooperative defense hypothesis which is suggesting that the defensive response of the non-incubating goal is stronger than that of the incubating goal. So this looks at when both mates are present, one of them, the one that's not sitting on eggs is uh, going to defend it strongly when the threat approaches, and the other is going to be able to focus on the incubation need because its mate is there to defend. And I looked at these goals responses using a categorical scale adapted from a study by McLean and Bonter in 2013. This scale runs from zero through eight, with zero being the least energetically costly defensive response and eight being the most energetically costly. So a zero on the scale, the goal is going to be quite relaxed. A one on the scale, the goal will alert as the predator, the threat approaches. Within 30 seconds, it relaxes again. A two on the scale, the goal is alert while the threat is uh, present near the territory. At a three. That's me, sorry. <laughs> At a three on the scale, then the goal will um, emit a cat, cat alarm call. It sounds like crack, crack. <laughs> At a four, I've heard plenty of this throughout the season. At a four on the scale, the goal will emit its more energetically costly, more alarmed call, um, the yow. Yeah. At a five, the goal is going to stand up off its eggs. At a six, the goal moves off the nest, staying within two meters of it in preparation to defend. At a seven, the goal launches into active defense. It may run at the threat. It may fly up a bit in the air and stomp down again. And then at an eight, the goal is very actively defending. It's usually going to be swooping at the threat. And uh, we exposed these goals to a local threat, the goal researcher, in a controlled manner and measured their responses. So a goal researcher walked up to a meter away from the nest. Uh, we had uh, meters marked with these fluorescent orange rocks and uh, recorded the responses of the incubating goal. And if the other goal was also present in the ter territory, its response as well. And uh, then I used this response data to analyze my two hypotheses. So for I analyzed the mate presence hypothesis looking at just data from the incubating goals, controlled for time of day, clutch size, individual goal ID determined by these bands that I talked about earlier, and uh, days pre-hatch. And this model accounted for about 51% of the variation in the goal's behavior. But as you can see, mate presence was a, not a significant influence on behavior. So most of this variation accounted for was just accounted for by individual ID that goals have different, different responses. Um, as you can see on the x-axis, I have responses. On the y-axis, I have the number of times I counted those responses. And whether the mate was absent or whether the mate was present, the response was about the same. The incubating goal tended to have a mid-scale defensive response. So the mate presence hypothesis does not explain goal's defensive behavior very well. The presence or absence of the mate doesn't seem to matter much to the response of the incubating goal. Then I looked at the responses from uh, both goals at the nest 
and uh, compared uh, the incubating goal with the one that was not incubating. Again, controlling for time of day, clutch size, individual ID, and days pre-hatch. Also for nest ID because these pairs of goals were connected to specific nests. This model accounted for about 32% of the variation in uh, goal behavior. And uh, as you can see, incubation status or whether or not the goal is incubating was uh, quite significant. So again, responses on the x-axis. The number of times those responses were counted is on the y-axis. On the right, you in the blue, you see uh, the incubating goals responses. They tend to be about the middle of the scale. On the left, in pink, you see the responses of the goals that were not incubating, and uh, they tend to have many near the middle of the scale and also many uh, high energy defensive responses. Especially interesting is we see a lot of those highest energy level eight responses for non incubating goals. So, this again, showing pretty much the same thing, but on the left in the pink, you can see the non incubating goal has a response on average about one point on the scale higher than that of the incubating goal on the right in the blue. And so the cooperative defense hypothesis does seem to explain these uh, goals be defensive behavior pretty well. Uh, when both mates are present in their territory, the non-incubating goal is going to have a strong response and the incubating goal will have a, a weaker response. And putting these things together that an incubating goal will have about the same defensive response whether or not its mate is present. But when both goals are in the territory, the non-incubating goal's response is going to be stronger. Then we can see that optimal defense may require two adults. And I say this because if a single goal could optimally defend its nest, then when both mates are in the territory, the incubating goal, which is experiencing the need to incubate, should be able to focus on that need to incubate because its mate is there able to fill the need to defend. Just as if you're facing this conflict of needs and you have a friend or family member who can make the meal for you, you can probably focus on one of your other needs such as cleaning the house. So that if optimal defense can only be accomplished by both goals, then when a goal is incubating and its mate is away foraging, then its eggs and chicks are quite vulnerable. So in short, goals on Appledore during the breeding season show cooperative behavior similar to uh, many monogamous birds and especially seabirds. They experience a conflict of needs while they're here. And uh, defense is a particularly interesting need because while incubation and foraging can both be accomplished by the goals as individuals, defense may optimally need uh, both goals to accomplish it. I had a lot of people helping me with this research. I would like to thank Rai, my delightful field partner, and uh, Dylan, who taught me pretty much everything I know about field work with goals. I'd also like to thank Dr. Kristen Covino, one of the PIs for this project, for her mentorship and help with a lot of research related things. And I would like to thank Mary Elizabeth Everett, another PI on the project, for her mentorship and help with all sorts of goal related things. I'd like to thank Mike and Dave for their mentorship in the surge program. The 2021-2022 surges for their help in the field and their feedback on research and being really great people to spend the summer with and the amazing Appledore staff for making the island run smoothly and all of this possible. And I'm open to any questions. <laughs> Hey, John Hala, questions for Hala? Yes, Lila. Um, in your work with the goal, have you observed any other, like other threats to the goal that they have to be kind of besides humans? So, Will is asking if in my work with the goals, I've observed any threats they would have to defend their nests from besides humans. And uh, the threats that they will face in a general breeding season are very few. They come to Appledore actually because it's a very safe place for them to breed. The main dangers are, yes, humans, and also there's some danger from other gulls, which are very territorial. Um, but the threats on the threat slide are ones that they may face more rarely. So raccoons came to Appledore some years ago 
and caused a lot of harm mm. in the colony then. Uh, cats also can be dangerous. They uh, shouldn't be loose on the island, but if one is, that's not good. And uh, then hawks, eagles, raptors do occasionally come over here. So a couple of years ago, we had one on the island and that was another threat they faced. Oh, from other threats? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, someone's asking uh, whether the responses that I'm seeing the goals uh, direct towards uh, researchers might be different from their responses to other threats and how I might design a study to look at that. So I think that will be a very interesting study. And uh, McLean and Bonter's study that I mentioned earlier uh, looks at something similar. It was looking at the responses of herring gulls to uh, various threats, uh, including people and uh, raptors. And it was looking at the vocalizations of various predators. And so they would play this potentially threatening sound and then record the herring gulls responses. So something like that might be possible. Another thing that I've seen done looking at, um, I think I think it's Northern Lockwing's responses to threats. There's a very interesting paper comparing their responses to cats and their responses to moorheads, which are not threatening, and their responses to ravens. And they use stuffed dummies to look at that. So that could be another possibility. Yeah, so uh, Dave is asking whether, uh, so cooperative defense is what this research was focused on, but great black fat gulls also act cooperatively to provision their chicks. And uh, avian influenza came to the island this summer and uh, some of the breeding adults perished. And so I was uh, studying the single uh, parents who had chicks and uh, considering uh, their behavior. And so Dave is wondering whether I saw anything interesting about the cooperative provisioning there. And uh, yes, I, it actually ties in very nicely to defense because uh, we have one single parent, OHX, who uh, her mate died uh, when the chicks were a couple of weeks old. And so they're still going to depend on their parents for a few weeks. And uh, she had three of them. And provisioning three chicks is a lot of work. <laughs> and uh, she was out fishing uh, pretty much every time I went by. Whereas I was looking at some of the other parents that had, that both parents were there able to provision the chicks. And it seemed, I haven't yet analyzed the data, so this is anecdotal, but it seemed possible that when both parents are there, then one is able to forage while the other stays in the territory and defends. Whereas when only one parent is there, that parent is out foraging almost all the time and the chicks are often alone. And it also seems that, that the from the few nests that I was able to study, then the ones with older chicks successfully were fledging chicks. The ones with quite young chicks tended to be abandoned and the nests fail. And so it's possible that older chicks are able to fend for themselves better while a parent is out foraging and younger chicks need to have a parent in the territory to defend them. And so single parenting can be successful if the chicks are old enough to not require as much defense so that provisioning can then be focused upon. Thank you. Thank you, Next up is Angie Flores from uh, UC Berkeley. Hi, Uh, 
Um, hi, my name is Angie Flores and I'm from UC Berkeley. I'm a rising sophomore and I am one of the marine mammal interns here. And today I'm gonna to present my uh, research project on photo ID of gray seals using an interactive individual identification system. Um, before I do that, I want to introduce you guys to some of our seals out here. So this guy's name is Mr. T, he's one of our favorites. And the way we identified him using photo ID is through that little T right there that you see. Um, and then this is our friend, lucky number seven. Um, and we saw seven on this guy, so that's how we identified him. So there's a lot of different ways that you can photo identify seals. So this is Christine and she has a C there. Um, and then also just random shapes that we see. So this guy's name is Fishhook because someone saw a fish hook there. Um, so yeah. Um, now I kind of want to test you guys to see how well you'd be able to identify this guy um, in a group of other seals, which is half of our job out here. So take a good look at this guy's name is Splotch and see if you can identify him on the next slide. So you can just shout out your answers, what you think it is. B. Okay, so there's a lot of different answers. Whoever said D was correct. <laughs> um, um, but as you can see, it's very difficult to identify, and we're only comparing four seals here. So I'd just like you to picture how hard it would be to try and identify a seal looking through over 600 different individual seals. That takes a lot of time and is very difficult. So I just kind of knew there had to be a better way that we could identify these guys. Um, but a little bit of background history of the gray seals here in the Northwest Atlantic. The first evidence of seals was 5,000 years ago. There's archeological evidence of them um, near like Native American settlements. So way before European colonizers. But then once Europeans did colonize, with them came a lot of overfishing. And instead of thinking maybe we're overfishing, they just blamed it on the seals and kind of thought that if they could set bounties on the seals and eliminate their population, their fish would come back. And that lasted for nearly like a century. It wasn't until 1962 that uh, the bounties were finished. And during that time, there was a total extirpation of gray seals in the Northwest Atlantic. And what that means is that they were basically extinct all around this region. Um, and in 1972, that's when we had our Marine Mammal Protection Act, which finally protected both of the seals that we see out here under this act. And since then, we've been seeing a slight population rebound. And that's kind of why we're out here doing this project is to monitor the seals out on Duck Island, which you see behind you, and um, see if their population numbers are coming back. So that's kind of what the Shoal Seal Program is about. We do photographic boat-based surveys two or three times a week where we go out to the island and we photograph the seals to count population numbers and look for things like entanglements, injuries, shark bites, disease. Um, but the one that interested me the most was like photo ID. And a quick note, every photo that you will see here besides a couple of few are photos that I took during one of these surveys. Um, so yeah, that's what Duck Island looks like from an aerial perspective. It is north of Appledore for those on Zoom. And then this is kind of why this site is so important. So this is where both grays and harbor seals fall out, which is not seen in very other places in the world. So it's a very unique place to study um, as to why they're out here. So the reason why identifying seals is so important is because, so first of all, it's a way safer method than tagging or branding, which is so invasive, um, as well as it tells us a lot about the site fidelity of seals. So this guy's name is Dolphin. We've seen him since 2011. And it kind of tells us a bit about the health of the seal because in 2000, or, yeah, 2022, we see these new scars on the seal that we didn't see beforehand. So that tells us there's either a shark interaction or a propeller strike that caused that seal to have those scars. Um, and what's really interesting is this seal has not only come back year to year, it's coming back to the exact same spot on the island. So it has this amazing site fidelity in which it knows exactly where to come back year to year. Um, and then on, in addition to that, you can also identify entangled seals. So here's kind of how we identify the seals. We code them one through four, with one being the lightest, so the most white to black weight ratio, and then the fourth one is a lot more black to white. 
Um, and usually the females are lighter than the males, but it's not always the case. So for, uh, coding the seals is really nice because it's unbiased. Um, so our current method of photo identification is going out there, taking about 300 photos per survey, and then looking through those 300 photos for identifiable individuals and comparing it to the over 600 individuals that we have. Um, and there's a lot of problems that come with that. One of them is the human eye can only recognize so much and we're all different. So I've noticed that my other intern and I have disagreed on what we're seeing in the same seal, like he'll see a seven and I saw an S. Um, and in addition to that, any seal that doesn't have some sort of shape is gonna go completely unpassed where they just have a normal pattern that the human eye just doesn't recognize any sort of shape through. Um, and it's also very time consuming. So I tried to do my research and question if there was a better way. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I get to this, which is can a photo identification software be used to identify recited seals? Is it possible? And that comes with two questions. The first one is, does its accuracy differ from a black to white ratio? So does the code one seal get better identified than the code four seal? Um, and then is the software learning over time? Is it getting more accurate as more images are added and as that database gets bigger, which is what the software so claims. Um, and I've done some research on previous methods of photo ID and seals, and there's three. SealNet was one that was not open to the public, which is why I haven't been able to use it, but it was using facial recognitions and harbor seals, which is pretty interesting. Um, Extract Compare is over 10 years old, it's around like 15 years actually, and I did try to download this software and use it. And it quite literally could not download on my computer. It's just, it doesn't exist anymore. And then Wild Me is one that's currently being used. And it uses like hotspots on a seal to try and um, compare it to all the other images. And that's the seal that you see up there It's for Sima seals, I believe. Um, so the one that I landed on was Interactive Individual Identification System. So this is a computer-aided photo identification software that relies on the natural markings of an individual and then scans it through the database to give you the most relevant results. So basically what it does is it extracts a pattern and then overlies it on all the other patterns that you've scanned. And the ones that overlap the most are basically like your matches. Um, and it gives you two numbers for this. It gives you score, which is out of 10,000. So 10,000 being absolutely not, it's not the same seal. And then zero being that's a copy image. Uh, it'll give you a score and then a numerical rank. So that's like the most relevant seals. It'll, it'll rank the seals one through however many seals you have. The first one being the most confident and the second one and so forth. Um, so the way I decided to test out my questions was to take the seals with the most recites, which ended up being 35 individuals who had more than three photos of them recited, uh, input those as my first 35 photos, and then add every single recite to see if knowing that I knew it was a recited seal, could the program do it? Um, and so what was really interesting, this is lucky number seven again, We've seen them since 2015, and both of these images that I added into the program came back with uh, like the first image. So it was the first seal that came up was the correct one, which I thought was really cool. Um, so to answer my first question as to whether or not there's a difference between codes, I compared code, which was the black to white ratio to their scores. And I got no significant difference between the different scores and the codes, which is exactly what we wanted. That means that no matter what kind of black to white ratio the seals are, the software can identify it and it can identify it well. I did the same thing, but instead of score, I did numerical ranks. So the first, second, third one. And this time I did get a significant difference between the code one and code four, um, which basically means that if a seal is really white with no black patterns on it, or really black with no white, the system's gonna have trouble identifying it because it needs some sort of pattern to scan since it's a pattern scanning software. Uh, and then to answer my second question, is the software improving? I once again compared score to number added. So number added was just the first image I added in, second image I inputted. And you can see there's a really significant decline. So over time, our scores are getting lower, which means it's getting more accurate and more confident of the input it's putting out. And I did the same thing with numerical rank. And although there wasn't a significant decline, you can still see there is a decline. It is getting a little bit better over time. Um, and then I got an average numerical rank of 5.8. And what this means is on average, the correct seal will show up in your first six images. So instead of looking through 600 different photos to find the correct seal, 
you really minimize that. Now you're only looking at for six on average. So that really speeds up the process for us to go out there, do more surveys, collect more photos, get more recites. And then the average score was 144.48. So once again, out of 10,000 being incorrect, we're getting a really low score, 140, 144 um, average score. So that means it works. The system can work basically on any code of seal with equal success rate. And the system's getting smarter and becoming more accurate over time, which is exactly what I wanted to see. There are a few limitations though. We have, it hasn't been tested on harbor seals, which is like half our population of guys out there. Um, and it's also less confident when identifying the gray seals that have little to no visible patterns. So the grays that you see up there are completely dry and it like looks like there's no patterns on them. Or it will be a seal that does have a pattern, but it's just like a lighter gray. And this, uh, the system basically needs a, more of a contrast between color patterns to scan it, or it'll just think it's all the same color. So there's a bit of a limitation on that. Um, so our next step is to add all of the current individuals that we have into this like software. So we have our full database. And then we can go in and get all those images that we don't know if, are, if they are a recite or not, and put them in the software to get all of those images that we've probably been missing of seals out there. And what that's going to do is give us a big, clear image of what really is going on on the dial of or the Duck Island and basically tell us things like site fidelity, health of the animals, and population numbers. So with that, I have utmost confidence that this method of photo identification and using computer softwares is the future of ID and is the future of how we're going to start collecting our data. Because with this method, it'll become way more efficient to go out there and do double, maybe triple the amount of surveys we're doing and get a clearer image of our seals. So with that, I want to acknowledge my amazing mentors, Dre and Lisa, science and residence, Mike Siegler, who literally taught me how to code in like less than 24 hours, uh, director Dave Buck, all of my fellow undergraduate researchers, and my mom and dad couldn't have done it without you guys. Thank you. <laughs>so the question is can the software be used for newborn seals or seals that have no pattern when they're younger yeah yeah so basically when seals are pups they actually don't have a pattern whatsoever they're like nice little fluffy guys and it isn't until like they reach like their maturity and they like shed all that off then once they like shed all of that off they'll have the exact same patterns for the rest of their life so it can be used for younger seals as long as they're not pups because those patterns may stretch if they get bigger but it's going to be the exact same pattern Other questions? Liz. i'm curious how you might adapt we have one example of the seal that has spar as a 22 and how you might that sort of information to the database that you forward might be able to identify Yeah. So uh, the question is knowing that I knew a seal had a scar, whether I could input that in the database and then look for seals that might change their patterns if now they have a scar. So what's really interesting about this data or like the software is that you can add a bunch of notes. So like if I'm 100% sure that that seal is a female, I can only search for female seals and that can reduce it. So same thing, if I know that that seal has a wound, I can look for wounded seals. So this could start working for our entangled seals that we haven't been able to recite yet because whatever reason, like we like, yeah, you can't see them. So through this, I could be just scanning for my entangled seals to see if we have a recite. Yes, Rai. Right. Well, I'm really curious about site fidelity because it's one thing for these seals to be returning like kind of basically in like the middle of nowhere back to this one spot, especially where both grays and harbors fall out. And then even more in depth, they're going for the exact same spot on that island is just really fascinating to me because they're not here year round, they're like seasonally coming here and they're seasonally coming to the exact same spot. So I'm very curious as to why that is. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. 
Nancy Ali, uh, Nancy's research partner, Engmar Sonarup, uh, University of Montana. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ingemar Sonnerup. I'm currently a senior studying aquatic, oops, aquatic wildlife biology at the University of Montana. I'm also the other marine mammal undergraduate researcher here at Shoals Marine Lab. And today I'd like to talk to you guys about my personal research looking at entanglement data between the years of 2011 and 2022. Uh, so I want to start off today by talking a little about the history of the interactions between um, seals and humans here in the Gulf of Maine, the Shoals Marine Lab uh, seal research project overall, and kind of the goals of my personal research here. But first, uh, a little about my history and what got me here. So my family has been fishing up in Alaska for sockeye salmon since 1986. Uh, my first year fishing, I was 15 years old, but I've been going up every summer since I was three and a half. Probably in this photo, I'm about 10. Um, and every year up there, we see harbor seals literally training their young to pick fish out of our nets without getting caught. So I've kind of been on one side of this issue where there's a little frustration. I'm not gonna lie, there's a little frustration. But uh, when I came here, I was really interested in doing a project focused on the interactions between seals and humans. And so here in Shoals Marine Lab, we're really kind of in hot water, so to speak with regards to the amount of boating traffic that we see. Oh, sorry. Um, and this, this boating traffic exists across like a variety of categories. We have shipping vessel traffic, we have recreational traffic. We also have a lot of fishing traffic. And so here in the Gulf of Maine, there are a lot of different fishing districts that target different species, use different gear types. And because of this, these different fisheries really do have um, different potentials for negative interactions with the seals that we have here. And so this relationship between fisheries and seals here in the Gulf of Maine has really not been all that cordial in the past. Um, in the Gulf of Maine, there was a bounty period between the years 1860 and 1962 in both Maine and Massachusetts. Uh, and this, these bounties were partially imposed because the fishermen really felt that the seals were stealing all their livelihood you know, getting rid of a way for them to make a living. Uh, and it's, it's estimated that these, this uh, bounty period led to the deaths of between 75 and 130,000 both gray and harbor seals during this period. It's this level of mortality that really led to the extirpation of gray seals in the Gulf of Maine and had a severe impact on the harbors as well. But since then, with the help of the Marine Mammal Protection Act passed in 1972, seals have really returned and rebounded within the Gulf of Maine. And one of these areas in the Gulf of Maine is Duck Island and the surrounding ledges where we've been studying seals since 2011. This is an area where both harbor seals and gray seals will haul out of the water to rest during reproductive periods or other important times. And here at Shoals Marine Lab, kind of the parent project to my sub-research has been um, photographic boat-based surveys of these seals every year since 2011 to study population sizes, tracking observed diseases if we see seals that are sick or have some kind of physical affliction, shark interactions, and unfortunately entanglements of these seals. So entanglements is just one of the risks that these seals face living in waters that have a lot of human and fishing usage. And it's really, really tough to see pictures like this every day. And the truth is that here in the Gulf of Maine, entanglement leads to the estimated annual deaths of 948 gray seals and 351 harbor seals. Lots of seals that become entangled actually do not survive and make it to haul out. So what we see over at Duck when we're doing our surveys is really just a small part of a larger problem. Fishermen too, are really feeling that these seals are causing a lot more trouble than they're worth. So research like this is really important so that we can start to work towards a solution that benefits everyone. So my overall objective with this project is to understand the seal entanglement data that we've collected here at Shoals Better across a variety of categories. 
Firstly, uh, my first question is how are entanglement prevalences changing over time at the year scale? And my hypothesis is that entanglement prevalences, that is the number of entangled seals we see out of the total number of that species is increasing for both harbor seals and gray seals. My second question is how do these entanglement prevalences we see differ between species? And that my, and my hypothesis for this question is that the mean gray seal entanglement prevalence is going to be higher than the mean harbor seal entanglement prevalence. My third question is how do the entanglement counts, the amount of entangled seals we see differ between material types? And my hypothesis for this question is that monofilament is going to be the most common entanglement material. And this is partially because monofilament is a very commonly used material here in the Gulf of Maine for fishing, netting, and line. And fourth, and these are, these are new questions, the previous three had been looked at past, uh, in the past in 2016. These two questions are my own and I wanted to add to our understanding. So the first being, what is the difference between gray seal sexes? So are we seeing more entangled female grays compared to males? My hypothesis is that there is going to be a difference between the mean male and female gray seal entanglement amounts. And the last question is, how do these entanglement counts differ by haul-out location? My hypothesis is that certain haul-out sites are going to have higher entanglement counts than others. So I'd like to quickly talk about the sampling methods that allowed me to collect data to answer these questions. So the first and most important part of our project is photographing seals and panoramic passes. So this is an image of the survey map that we use when we do our photographic surveys of Duck Island and the surrounding ledges. With this map, we're really able to break down our photographs by area like so. The photographer will say something like, starting past one of one south, they're kind of in the lower left, and then later past one of one south was to image 11. And using this system, we can really look back at our photos and count precisely the number of seals that we see at each location, as well as keep track of where we see entangled seals, which I'll show you an example of in a second. So the second part of this project that's really important is the meta naming that tells us specifically what we're looking at in each seal photo we come across. For example, 61422 HGF left ventral three north red mesh entanglement may sound like gibberish, but really it's telling us that we're looking at the left ventral side of a female gray seal, HG being shorthand for Halicaris gryphus, the Latin name, that was photographed entangled in red mesh at three north, so kind of there on the right, on June 14th, 2022. This meta naming really tells us a lot about each photo and gives us a lot of val uh, sorry, valuable information to work with. Using this meta naming system, I was able to collect the data I needed. So I'd like to quickly talk about what my results are. Firstly, this first question is, what sort of trends and entanglement prevalences differ over time? This is a figure of year, on the x-axis and entanglement prevalence for gray seals on the y-axis. And based on this figure, entanglement, entanglement prevalences are not significantly increasing or decreasing for gray seals over time. This is this, a similar sort of figure for harbor seals with again, year on the x and entanglement prevalence on the y-axis. And actually with this figure, we're able to tell that and based off of this p-value, we can tell that entanglement prevalences are significantly decreasing for harbor seals over time. So between species, what sort of difference do we see in entanglement prevalences for gray seals compared to harbor seals? This is a figure of entanglement prevalence broken down by species over the years on the x and entanglement prevalence on the y-axis. And based on this, we can see that there is a higher, a statistically significantly higher mean entanglement percentage for gray seals compared to harbor seals, which shows that it is something that impacts gray seals more than harbor seals. So what sort of material types do we see causing entanglements? And among identified materials, monofilament is responsible for 37.8 of the observed entanglements that we've seen, whereas marine debris and or other material types, so that could be anything from an aerobi frisbee to something that we know it's not monofilament, but it's still something we can identify. And then the other 59%, which is a huge chunk, are these unknown cases where we know we have an entangled seal, but because we're not able to see what material type is, 
what material type it is, we cannot concretely say. And so which sex is it impacting female grays more than grace or uh, male grays? Um, this is a figure of the number of entanglements for both male and female grays on the y-axis and you're on the x-axis. And this figure really shows that consistently we have seen a higher number of entangled female grays than male grays, with the exception of between 2012 and 2014. And lastly, where are we seeing entangled seals hauled out? So this is a figure of sight on the X and number of entanglements counted on the Y axis for gray seals. And just based off of this, we can see that gray seals preferent. We have seen gray seals more often in certain locations than others. And the same is true for harbors. So with this figure, uh, just showing the map again, the blue arrows represent where we have counted lots of gray entanglements and the red arrows represent where we've counted lots of harbor entanglements. I will say with this result, these are also areas where we have counted more seals overall. And so that's kind of something that should also be considered. Uh, these are just more popular haul out locations. So to conclude, it looks like harbor seal entanglement prevalences are decreasing, whereas gray seal entanglement prevalences might or might not be changing. Mean gray seal entanglement prevalence is higher than harbor seal entanglement prevalence. Monofilament is a super common material type among identifiable material entanglements. And here at Shoals Marine Lab for this project, we have counted more entangled female gray seals than males. And we actually have seen more entangled seals hauled out in areas where we also see more seals overall. So what's next? It's really important that we continue to study this issue this is a really hotly contested issue here in the Gulf of Maine. It's really important that we continue to document it, collect data on it so that we can hopefully eventually start to work on a solution that doesn't leave someone feeling like they've gotten the short end of the stick. There's also, it's really important to be talking about this, showing that you care. If you see something, say something. This is a phone number for a marine mammal disentanglement hotline through the Center for Coastal Studies. They do really great work. Um, and this is a multi-interest issue. Uh, it's really important uh, when we're trying to solve this to work with fishermen and not against them. And lastly, thank you all for listening to the talk today. I would like to thank my project mentors, Dr. Andrea Bomoni and Lisa Setti for all their help this summer. I would like to thank scientists and residents, Dr. Mike Sigler, Lindsay Williams, and Owen Nichols for their help. And lastly, I would also like to thank all of the SML staff and the surgeons. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting question. Um, I think in order to answer that, this is really just that we have seen more counted. When I was going through the data and looking for this question, like collecting data to answer it. I observed that there were a lot of entangled grays where we actually weren't able to identify what sex the gray seal was. And so those were omitted. So I think, I think if I was able to go back, increase my confidence, sort of retroactively identify those seals that I would be able to develop a stronger sense of the actual pattern. So this is just based off of what I was able to do. Kayla. Yeah, and it looks like monofilament is the cause of an enormous portion of the identified entanglements. Is that because monofilament is the most common type of entanglement material that would be out there? Or do you think there might be some other reason that makes it? Yeah, so it would be interesting um, to kind of do additional research. I don't have an answer for you right now. I just think it would be really cool to look at if it's caused by the usage of monofilament targeting a species of fish that overlaps with what seals prey upon, or if it's the nature of the material. So if it's a question of this overlap in prey and fishing target species, or if it's the material type that's just causing it by itself. Anyone else? Yeah. Awesome talk. Thank you. Um, have any thoughts about why entanglements in um, harbor seals might be declining? 
and if there might be any management recommendations that we should draw for that decline? Uh, so I will say that this decline in harbor seal entanglement prevalence has kind of been accompanied by a slow but gradual decrease in the amount of harbor seals that we're seeing. And so I think that there might also be, um, that might be related in some way. Like we are just not seeing enough harbor seals there to see an entanglement based on how low the percentage is. Um, but also entanglement really does kill a lot of seals. In a lot of cases, the harbor seals are not strong enough to swim to a point where they could haul out. They commonly will drown. And so in some cases, we just aren't seeing them hauled out. And so they don't make it into our data at all. Anyone else? Sweet. Thanks, Amar. Thank you. OK, so I don't think, I feel like this day really perfectly sums up why this kind of experience creates scientists. I want you to remember these are undergraduate students who just presented all this amazing scientists. They sound like graduate students. There's some amazing stuff going on here. And this is how we build understanding. And I hope you all feel incredibly proud of the fact that we have just now pushed our understanding of all of these species and all of these systems forward. This is how we build understanding so that we can protect and conserve and manage the resources around us. I would be a bad executive director if I didn't say that it is very hard to fund long-term monitoring studies. They are not cool because they have been going on for decades. They're not flashy and hot and the next best coolest thing, right? It is hard. A lot of these programs are underfunded. So if any of you in the audience listening are interested in helping support this, we would be super grateful and you can see what it produces. Knowledge and scientists. So science is a, a human pyramid. We stand on the shoulders of those before us and we build knowledge up from that. So we are super grateful on behalf of Shoals Marine Lab that you have all helped us push these long-term studies and your individual research and understanding of these systems forward. So you're a huge part of the legacy of this lab and you will carry that forward in your careers. And, and these people around you are also gonna be really valuable to you. So don't lose track of each other. These are your scientific cohorts that are going to help you move forward. So, and, and all of us here at Shoals are 100% going to support you. So Dave and I write lots of recommendation letters. Mike is a great recommendation letter writer. So please use us to your advantage. And that is the last I want to say on the summary, but again, congratulations and thank you all so much. You did a fantastic job. Everyone join me and congratulating them. <laughs> <laughs> so we have some appreciation for all of your hard work all summer that Dave and Mike are going to dole out. And after this, we would like to get any mentor that's here and the surges all together outside so we can get some photographs of that. And then um, I don't have the thing in front of me. Um, don't forget, for those of you on the island, you're going to meet at the dock at 345. Okay. So I can kind of take over. Mike, Jen, and I all felt like it's um, now been uh, integral members of our community out here for close to 10 weeks. So you have some perspective on sort of how we do it. This book <laughs> is a wonderful story of a little bit of myth, a little bit of fact, a little bit of fiction <laughs> of how the lab got built. Have a gift for each of you. It's a copy of the book and then some art. He was this guy was a student when I was a student. He creates beautiful artwork. Like up uh, there to the left. That right there. But actually, the one that you're getting is that one. Yay. So, um, 
and get it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to meet on the back deck there for photographs. Um, one more, one more. Uh, people tell people how they should how they how they how they <laughs> Yes, you can contact me directly if you want to donate to any of these programs, or you can go to shoalsmarinelaboratory.org. And there's a sh support Shoals button at the top of the website. Thank you for that question. We appreciate it. Thank you all so much online for joining us. It was a pleasure having you. And um, you will, we appreciate you being here. <laughs> Anyone want to say goodbye to their family before I? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Anyone else? A couple more students. Anyone else want to say goodbye to people online? Okay. See everyone.